Good evening. It is March the 7th, Monday, and it's 6 o'clock, and we are here for a series of three public hearings. We thank you all for coming out this evening after an absolutely beautiful, warm, unlike March day. Uh, we want to make sure that we hear from everyone who is here or who has chosen to participate by Zoom tonight, and we're asking that you please limit your comments to no longer than three minutes uh, so that everyone who wishes to speak will have a chance to speak. We will be giving a two-minute warning. Kayla here will be is our timekeeper, and she will let you know when two minutes have passed. And we're asking that you try to contain your comments to no more than three minutes. Uh, if some, we also would ask that if someone has already spoken and addressed the comments that you wish to share, uh, that you just indicate that you're supportive of whoever spoke before, and 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 then allow us to go on and hear from others who may have other other things they wish to say. We are very interested in, in hearing from everyone who wishes to speak this evening. You will note that Khalil Saliba is missing this evening. He had a previous commitment and could not be here. However, he will probably join us later in the evening once his prior commitment is uh, completed. And if he is unable to, or even if he is able to, he will have the opportunity to listen to the entire hearing this evening uh, because it is being recorded. So he will have the benefit of hearing all of your comments uh, whether either this evening or later. As I mentioned, there are um, three items on the agenda. And um, the, I would, uh, before I read it, I would tell you that the first item on the agenda is, is ordinance number 5-22. And as of noon today, we had received 88 supportive comments in reference to this ordinance, 13 uh, comments opposing it, and two comments that had questions regarding it. Um, and we'll, uh, I'll, read the, I'll read the item and then we'll talk about a little bit more about this. So the, the public hearing and discussion regarding Ordinance 5-22, an ordinance to amend Article 4 regulations, Article 6, Historic Preservation Architectural Review Commission, and Article 16, definitions of Chapter 197, Zoning of the Municipal Code of the City of Lewis, Delaware, by amending Sections 197-45, 197-57 and 197-106 relating to museums and museum expositions. As everyone in this room, I'm sure, will recall, uh, there was uh, a hearing uh, about this conducted by the H Park, and there was an outcome there that then ended up with the, re with the uh, request going before the Board of Adjustment. At the Board of Adjustment hearing, uh, there was testimony given by Dan Griffith the former State Historic Preservation Officer, and Tim Slavin, the, his, the Director of Historical and Cultural Affairs for the state. Both of them spoke uh, in reference to uh, museums and exhibitions, uh, and Anne-Marie is going to 
speak a little bit about that. Anne Marie, would you like to comment? Sure. I um, so the board of adjustment held their meeting in this room. It lasted, according to the recording, five hours and forty-four minutes. Um, I did make a point to rewatch um, the bulk of that meeting um, over the past couple of days and to take some specific notes based on the comments made by both Dan Griffith and Tim Slavin. Um, as, as the mayor said, um, Dan Griffith was the State Historic Preservation Officer and Director of Historical and Cultural Affairs for 16 years. Um, in his testimony, what, what really stood out to me was um, he started with a slide that showed a wigwam village. And the question asked was, <coughs> did the wigwam village meet the, the rhythm and scale of the Secretary of the Interior guidelines to be able to be placed? And, and there, there was agreement that it did not. And he, then the question was asked of him, should LHS be able to put on an exhibit with wigwams on its campus? His response was, absolutely, particularly in, in Lewis. And then he referenced the Native American history of Lewis. Um, one of the board members asked him, should there be some standard to apply to any museum space? To which Mr. Griffith responded, yes, that there should be safety, accessibility, and reasonable standards applied. Um, after he spoke, Tim Slavin spoke, as the mayor mentioned. Again, he has been the director of historical and cultural, cultural affairs for 16 years. So between the two of them, that's the last three decades of that division. And the Division of Historical and Cultural Affairs oversees both state museums and um, the Historic Preservation Office. Um, so, Mr. Slavin spoke specifically to the threat to museums if they are not able to exhibit um, you know, their collections and concern about um, government regulation of museums and the implications that that would have across Delaware and, and across the museum community at large. He also spoke about diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion and the importance of the object as it relates to the African American history in Lewis. So when, when the Board of Adjustment heard the appeal, it was about the jurisdiction of, of H Park. And one of the things that our city solicitor said in, in defending the city's position was that they made very compelling comments about what the ordinance should be, but not what the ordinance is as it stands. So coming out of that hearing, we started to look at, is there a way to address those comments that Mr. Slavin and Mr. Griffith made about having reasonable standards and not interfering with the ability of, of a museum to, to display its artifacts? Um, to that end, we developed an ordinance. That's the, the subject of this evening's meeting. As the, the mayor mentioned, we've gotten a lot of comments in, um, largely supporting, um, allowing the, you know, having an ordinance that would allow the net reel to stay. Um, but we also received a number of comments um, with concerns about the grandfathering provisions. So over on the table, there are two versions of an ordinance. Version A, which is the, the one initially proposed, and version B, which would look to, to address some of those concerns. So the big difference is on page two in the highlighted language, in version A, it states that if it, for something installed after February 1st, 2022, it would have to meet the, the setback of one half the height of the object. 
and have a maximum height of 20 feet, and that anything um, from before February 1st, 2022 was deemed to be in compliance. That specific provision was what um, we received a number of, of concerns about. So what we've done is I have, again, a version B, and, a ver and the original one, the version A, so as you make your comments this evening, um, that is something you may want to weigh in on about whether it should um, fully grandfather the location, not just on the campus, but right up on the sidewalk without any, any setback, or whether it would stay in the, prop, in the same location. Again, this is not just about the net reel. This would resolve the issue of the net reel, but this would have a different standard for how outdoor museum exhibitions would be treated in the zoning ordinance. So that would be the case for any other museum property. It doesn't have to be a history museum. It could be an art museum, some type of outdoor display. I mean, we have to think kind of what could come under this, um, and, and we did um, I think we, we took a lot of care to make sure that um, we anticipated what could come. So those are kind of the introductory comments um, I would make um, to, to kind of give you a sense of what we're looking at and, and how we got here. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. And as Anne Marie said, there are two versions. If you didn't get the second version, you're welcome to go pick it up. I think she's done a very good job of explaining how the one version differs from the other. And there are plenty of copies over there. I think the chief has them uh, in his hands. So, uh, But I also would defer a moment to Glenn to talk about the role of the Board of Adjustment in the, in the, and versus the role of the code. Thank you for that, Mayor. Um, I was going to, Amory did a great job. There's a few comments you made that I was going to make and don't need to now. But as far as the Board of Adjustment goes, you know, the Board of Adjustment is a, is a is a public body created under Title 22 state law. So it has its own um, authorities and obligations, and it gets to hear um, appeals from the, the zoning code. And in this instance, the most recent hearing that Anne Marie was speaking of, the Board of Adjustments, um, the Board of Adjustment had kind of a narrow, limited role. And their role was to decide whether the Historic Preservation and Architectural Review Commission had jurisdiction over the historic and cultural zoning district. The Lewis Historical Society is located in that zoning district, so the issue was really, can H. Park look at um, zoning issues as they relate to um, the historic cultural district? As Anne-Marie said, we went through that hearing. They, um, in their limited, narrow um, review of that issue, they concluded that H. Park did have um, review authority over the historic, um, the cultural historic district. Um, but as Anne-Marie said, that hearing did expose or reveal um, perhaps deficiencies in our code um, in how we as a city um, deal with and treat museums. So the Board of Adjustment performed its role for sure. Now you've got a legislative body, being the, the mayor and city council, who they also have a role in city governance. And one of, the, one of their roles is when there's deficiencies exposed within the code, possibly taking legislative action to address those deficiencies. So this, so while this legislation that's before you all as a public to comment on today and, and this board of um, city council, um, you know, this is sort of the natural process of how legislation typically evolves. Something happens that exposes um, maybe an area that needs to be looked at legislatively. That's what happened here, and now they're taking a look at it legislatively, and this is the process for um, creating new laws within, within the city. So I, I think there's been a question about whether, you know, there's an, whether it's appropriate or not for a city council to take action after a board of adjustment has acted. It, it's two different functions. Board of adjust, adjustment performed their function, um, and now the legislators are performing their function. So I don't see personally and, and, and based upon my knowledge of law and how different boards have different roles and obligations, I don't see any um, 
inconsistency with what the board did and what the city council is now considering as a legislative matter. Thank you very much. Thank both Anne Marie and Glenn for your explanation. Hopefully that answers some of the questions that were posed. Um, I would just comment in case someone doesn't wish to speak, we will also be keeping the record open on, on tonight's hearing until Thursday afternoon, March the 10th. This is Thursday at 4 p.m. We need to receive public comments in writing uh, or email, uh, and please send them to Janelle, uh, 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 before 4 p.m. On, on Thursday the 10th. So with that, uh, if we could have an idea of how many people we have on Zoom. Janet, do we have a number? Yes, 20. 20, okay. So we have a room full of people. It's, 60, it's 62 now. 62, okay. <laughs> I figured it was going to grow. 20 seemed awfully sparse, can you even, what we That's a five of six. Okay. Well, you know, 15 minutes makes it. So 62. Anyway, so we are now ready to receive public comment. We'll start with comments from the room. Uh, would, would you like to go first, Mr. Okay, thank you. Please come to the microphone. Identify yourself by name and address, and uh, let us hear from you. My name is John Bucchioni. 30738 Mary Mitchell Drive. Um, I'll be brief. As a former uh, graduate history teacher, uh, Lewis, a lot of firsts, a lot of history. And what I'm going to say is intangible. Find a way tonight, folks. This is very special. Just find a way to keep the net reel here. I stand with keeping the net reel where it is. Don't let the perfect get in the way of the possible. Lewis is very historic. Let's keep it special. That's it. Thank you very much. Would someone else care to speak? Mr. Kibble. My name is Peter Kibble of Grove Estate Road, Lewis, and I'm the chairman of the Historical Society. I would like to speak in support of the proposed ordinance, version A, it gives us clear guidance for museums like us on how we can place our exhibits going forward. That would be very helpful and was guidance that wasn't available prior to today. I obviously support the grandfathering aspect. Without that, who knows what other museum exhibits might now fall foul of such an ordinance. Uh, if you make this retroactive, I don't know what will happen to our net reel. We, we're a not-for-profit. We can't afford to move it again. We think this is the only net reel still in existence in the country, and we risk losing it. I, and when you look at it, is it really that bad? If we put a smoking fire furnace there, I could understand the outrage. But this has been described by so many people as such an important object in part of our Lewis history for so many reasons, I would urge the commissioners to adopt the new version A change in the ordinance. Thank you. Okay. Would someone else care to speak? Charlotte, can you get up here? I bet, I bet uh, Bill Collick will help you up there. Sorry for the drama and getting up. No <laughs> That's you, Charlotte. Really get up there. <laughs> there was a time when That's I could just you. walk up. <laughs> um, I, um, my name is Charlotte King, and I am the chair of the Southern Delaware Alliance for Racial Justice. So address? I speak. Well, just give us your address. For the my moment. address is 36188 Topron Drive in Wolf Point, just right over the city line. Um, but as I said, I speak, I hope, for all 15 or 1,600 members of the Alliance in support of this ordinance. And I just want to excerpt a few um, significant facts for us. I think the significance of the net wheel is much more about the growth and stability of Lewis and the surrounding areas as it is about the successful use of our diverse labor force. And I want us to keep that in mind because my support really um, comes from my work with the Lewis Historical Society in discovering that the Manhattan Ethel made Lewis. 
It grew from a town to a city as a result. And that is one of the most significant facts of its history. Um, Lewis developed into a financially strong city with national significance and invisibility because of the successful production of fish oil utilized for the ex expansion of many products throughout the nation. Uh, I also want to point out that the net wheel is a legitimate and significant part of Lewis history and should be rightfully preserved. It is not for those of us retiring to Lewis to dismiss his history. And we all know that to dismiss one's history, uh, one can't really deal much with their present or with their future. The history is important for many reasons. And I really feel strongly that as people move into the town, they must recognize you're moving into a historical area. I want to commend the Lewis Historical Society uh, because in their efforts they have shown for me, uh, which is very important, and for the African-American community, that they are committed to preserving the history of all of Lewis, and this is an important part of that history. So um, without saying much more, because I'm down to now 30 seconds, um, <laughs> I thank you that I encourage all of us to support it, and not from our taste, but from the historical significance. Thank, thank you. you. Do you care to comment on version A or B, Charlotte? Um, a would be leaving, would be grandfathering, B would be not grandfathering. The location. Uh, actually, I, when I look at where the wheel is now, I would like to think, and I was going to say, I will commit the first thousand dollars to the Lewis Historical Society, the Starry Fund, to move it five feet back into the center of the campus, if that was a possibility. I think it should remain on the campus. Um, I think that if we could just move it, but they can't move it without all of us chipping in as we did for Canal Front Park and as we did for all other major projects. Let's keep the wheel and let's ask the Lewis Historical Society, is there a little space, just maybe five feet, um, so that those people who are really against it because it's sort of hanging into the yard, um, won't well, we have to we'll destroy their property for why we should move it. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Yeah. But it should remain on the campus. The okay, campus thank you. Move, it should remain where it is. Okay. Thanks, Charlotte. Thank you, Charlotte. Okay, would someone else care to speak? Yes, Elaine. Well, I'm here. I hadn't seen uh, version B until this tonight, but looking at it, I'm How about certainly. An address for us, please? Excuse me, I'm Elaine Zimmerman, and I am 418 West 4th Street, and I have lived in Lewis in a 1980s restored historic house in Burton subdivisions uh, since it was a 1790s house. It was on the canal originally, and I've served as chair of the Lewis Historic Preservation Commission for eight years, uh, and I was a neighbor to Charlotte and Amy. Um, many um, of us tonight have just seen this version B for the first time. My reaction to it is that's much preferable to, to it and may really solve a lot of problems. So in general, um, if we have to compromise, that's starting in the right direction. I was really concerned about um, the laws and following the current laws and regulations and with our system in the city of checks and balances. And I was also very concerned about making ex exceptions for any entity in, within the bounds of the historic district. And the Lewis Historic um, property uh, that belongs uh, to the Historic Society is in, within the, uh, the uh, map, the historic map. They certainly were part of the uh, group that put it together in the first place. They were very knowledgeable that they were in the historic district, so there should be no doubt about that. Um, so I would say to you, I implore you, as mayor and, mayor and members of city council, to follow our current laws and regulations and their systems of checks and balances. Don't make any exceptions for any entity 
within the historic district. Others would demand those same exclusions One and exceptions. Warning. Don't start the process of removing entities like the Lewis Historic Society's main campus from our historic district map. Others will think they can follow. Don't use a dubious definition of grandfathering to allow the net re reel to remain in its illegal location. This is a weak and divisive reproach to the situation. Don't disrespect the people who are serving on your strong and hardworking commissions. In this case, the Historic Preservation and Architectural Review Committee, H Park, and the Board of Adjustments, the BOA. Others may choose not to serve in those commissions. Throughout America, local historic commissions like RH Park do their work separately and away from local political influence. Because H Park is not answerable to the mayor and city council, historic preservation decisions are made solely on the considerations of the properties themselves using the existing Lewis regulations. And as to the net reel itself, since 1988, I have lived next to my black neighbors in Burton subdivision. I appreciate the idea of the uh, American Heritage Committee. Please Man wrap it up, Levine. Okay, one more Your time. Your time is up. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, would anyone else care to speak? Yes, Trina. Please remember to identify yourself by address as well as name. Thank you. I'm Trina Brown Hicks, 504 DuPont Avenue. And I am a born and raised Lawstonian. <laughs> I love my town. I love my state. My father was a Manhattan fisherman. He, with, with the real being where it is at the Lewis Historical Society, I pass by it every day, and I love seeing it there. When it was down by the canal, I did not know it existed. I think where it's at is where it needs to be. I agree with version A, and I can say that what I heard on the meeting with H Park was disappointing, but I am glad there is a, a legislative way, as Mr. Vandalis has explained, to help resolve this issue, and I thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Chief. Would anyone else care to speak? Yes, Mr. Cheevers. I see a hand in the back. We'll get to you momentarily. Owen Cheevers. I live... Um, 414 Pilot Town Road. Uh, first, I want to commend the City Council for realizing that the structure of H Park's decision making along the lines of harmony and cityscape makes absolutely no sense for an open air museum. And in their definition of what they are, they're basically focusing on architecture, which to me means windows, doors, roofs. And this is a tool that has been a fundamental part of Lewis's growth and stability throughout 30 years, 60 years. Um, it also speaks volumes about um, the fairness at which the, the owner of the, the fishing industry treated uh, all workers. And I think that that should be commended to give them a living wage and, and, uh, and to highlight that. Mm -hmm. Now you can't highlight that when you have it stuck uh, at the canal and it's uh, deteriorating by the day it's used, is, it was once they tried to burn it. Most of the time it's used as a jungle gym for, for the kids. And there was no story behind it. It was just a, a wheel spinning a net. And that's what the, the captains of the sightseeing boats would point out. But none of us knew about the Manhattan fish industry to any length. And where it is now, and I support item A because I think moving it is just a waste of money, um, that, uh, with the African-American tour being constructed, that net reel is a cornerstone of what enabled the black community to develop its own businesses, its homes. It's on the corner of, of basically the heart of the African-American community at that time. Um, to think about, as some people put in the Cape Gazette in the letter, to move it to Belltown, 
of all places, is just ridiculous. The other fact that where it's located now. One minute warning. Okay, where it's located now, both uh, people elderly and with disabilities could actually just drive right up to it and read it. Hopefully the plaque is improved to tell a bit more of the story than, than, than it does now. Um, but could, could view it. If it's stuck behind in some other park or down by the canal, it's not gonna be part of that walking tour. So I, I strongly believe that it's in the right place in the Lewis, it's the Lewis Historical Society. It's not all of Delaware, it's not the whole United States, although it's the only net reel in the country, supposedly. But it tells the story of Lewis. It belongs on that campus. Uh, and I think they did a very good job of placing it there. So those are my thoughts. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. I think I saw Gabby's hand back there. Come on up. Hello, my name is Gabby Lennon. I live at 519 East Cape Shores Drive. I am for Proposition 9, uh, B, B, <laughs> 9, <laughs> whatever. Come on, Gabby. Uh, I personally think it's out of place. It was always on the tour. My husband gave the tour, and it's uh, where the overfalls is, and uh, life-saving station is, which all should be included, that is Lewis. Lewis is not just in the historic society. It's the city of Lewis. Thank you. So are you voting for version A or B or not in the for none? B. 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 Okay, <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, next person who would like to comment. Bonnie, come on up. Well, uh, we're going to get Bonnie for Al Al Osler first, and then we'll get to you, Tracy. No, that's okay. I don't know. Are you sure, Tracy? Okay. Can I just say I'm glad I'm on this side? <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. Good evening, Bonnie. Bonnie Osler, 901 Savannah Road. I served on council from 2012 to 2021 and was council's ex officio representative to H Park for many years. H Park is the consistent, unsung champion of historic preservation in this town. The commissioners are trained and dedicated, applying oral, our historic preservation law equally and fairly to all. I know I've watched H Park for years. Without H Park's steadfast work, Lewis wouldn't be an historic town. It would be an historic replica town. Yet council now proposes to exempt the Lewis Historical Society from H Park's standards and review. This ordinance isn't really about the Manhattan Re Manhattan Real. It's about bestowing special status on LHS. It's literally about changing the law to place LHS above the historic preservation requirements applicable to everyone. Is this fair? Is it right? Why should LHS be exempted from historic preservation rules? Indeed, why would the Lewis Historical Society want to embrace, not want to embrace the city's historical preservation standards? Further, why would council reward LHS for flouting the historic preservation by exempting it from the historic preservation laws? Regardless of how one feels about the real, this ordinance reeks of favoritism for a special interest. This is not good government, this is very bad government. And I have to differ from Anne-Marie's chronology. Council on its June 14th, 2021 agenda talked about uh, taking LHS out from under the rules. So whatever was said at the Board of Adjustment hearing on November 2nd really was after the fact. As for the real, there is no question that it is an historic structure for all residents. H. Park unanimously found, however, that the LHS's placement of it violated universally accepted historic preservation standards. Tellingly, LHS never claimed that H. Park's decision was wrong on the law. Instead, in its unsuccessful- One minute warning. Beg your pardon? One minute warning. Oh, I'm gonna have to go really fast. <laughs> I, let me just turn to one thing, which is this whole idea of grandfathering. This term has been kicked around, and this ordinance is not grandfathering. It's the opposite of grandfathering. Grandfathering is where you have a legal action, and you change the law, and the legal action becomes illegal. This is the opposite of that. This is an illegal act, the placement of the real uh, against our, our historic preservation principles that this council is talking about making legal. That's not grandfathering, 
As the city, council, the city solicitor stated when asked, this type of governmental action is quite unusual and for very good reason. So what you, I think you need to do, and one other thing that I think you need to consider, is if you adopt this ordinance, you will encourage many others to seek similar treatment. And on what basis will council say no to the coming parade of favor seekers? That it only gives special changes to museums? Good luck with that. And special dispensation request to council will not be limited to H Park matters. So what I would urge this council to do is to do the right thing, to stand up for historic preservation, to stand up for good government, and to vote down this okay. abysmal ordinance. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. That was only a little over. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. No, there will be no applause, please. We're having public testimony here. Okay. Uh, who would like to speak Tracy. next? Tracy. Tracy, come on up. First of all, um, I. I'd like to um, say that I respect the city for looking at this as that has been pointed out that there was probably Can we some. Just get your name and address. Oh, for I'm the sorry, record, Tracy please? Mulvaney, 423 Thank Painter you. Avenue. Thank you. Um, I, I think that it was time to look at the ordinances regarding museums, as has been pointed out. Uh, there, there are some needs to address that. I think that the problem here is, as Bonnie just pointed out what in this grandfathering thing you're doing is taking an, an action that was already declared illegal and now trying to make it legal. And I think that's a mistake, and I think that it, it um, is a discouragement to anyone who wants to be involved in any aspect of volunteering for the city in, in any way, because it says that it's okay if you say this is, you know, you're gonna work for this, but we can decide behind closed doors to change the rules and it doesn't matter whether it's legal or not. And that's it. Thank you. So are you voting, would you vote for A? I would vote for version B. Okay. B. Thank you. Okay, next person. Yes, come on up, George. Make sure you identify yourself by name and address, please. I'm George Farrett. I live at Six Ship Carpenter. Can you pull the mic up? Sure. She was a little shorter. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry, Matt. I'm going on a trip, so I have to be careful. Um, George I'm George Farrett, Farrett Six Farrett. Ship Carpenter Square. Um, I have three points, and I'll go to them quickly. The first is um, whether or not we <laughs> value the fishnet reel. And I, I have actually gained a greater understanding of its importance to the African American community. Um, but I don't understand why that particular location is so great. I do understand that maybe a more um, noticeable location would be it was an improvement, but I don't understand why that specific location. But second point is the H Park made a decision, and, and to the last speaker's point, that decision needs to be um, a, a, a upheld by the um, council. I, don't, I think it's bad precedent to do as the two former um, latter speakers just mentioned. And the third point is, as I understand both versions, the historical society would have free range to do what they want up to a height limitation <laughs> with no oversight whatsoever. And I'm not sure I understand why that serves the public good. I understand the, the TP example, um, and that could be, I mean, they could have challenged this decision they could ask for permission for a TP. Um, they could do a TP for up to 90 days. I think that's fine. Or they could work with the historical profession, um, the H Park, to get rules about things that may not be um, abodes or homes, um, structures, and, and go through a process to, to adapt those rules for um, exhibits. But I think giving them with no oversight is poor, pre poor precedent, poor judgment, poor um, um, governance. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next person who wishes to speak. Hey, come on up, sir. He didn't say which one. Yeah. So, so, Mayor, I just wanted to let you know there 
is quite a bit of stuff chat. in the chat. Yeah. So um, I do want to say if you are putting anything in the chat that you wish to be recognized as a public comment, um, include your name and address for the record. And when we get to the virtual <laughs> attendees, we can read it. If it does not have right. your, you. your name and address, then we will not share your comment. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good, Good evening. evening. Can you pull that uh, down a little bit? Sorry. Pull your mic the, down the mic. a little bit, sir. The, and give I'm us your name and address. I'm bored most of the time, so I don't normally need a mic. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> For the people at home, you do. That's okay. You can hear it on Zoom <laughs> that, as well. Yeah. So. I, I was born and raised in Lewis around 1938, so I remember a lot of things about Lewis. A lot of things a lot of you probably don't know about and have forgotten and that type of thing. We need your Get name, your sir. your name and address, sir. I used to walk the pier with Otis Smith. Yes, sir, your name and address before you get started. Lewis Edward Riley. Uh, Orchard Road, two miles from where I was born and raised. Thank Need you. more? No, we're good. <laughs> anyway, uh, it wasn't, I think the wife and I drove all, teaching school in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, drove all the way down here just to hear the Shantamen uh, Im imitate how they pulled the nets and all at Presbyterian Church. The next morning I called uh, Cecil, married in my cousin, and told him how much I enjoyed it. And he says, well, Loisy, your father worked the boat, and your uncle did too. Never knew that. They were firemen on those boats. Mm -hmm. So I suspect that it was just from coal or something they did. That was that far back. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other side of my family, go back to the 1700s. And if you've been paying attention, you see me up in that cemetery quite often. Mm -hmm. It's almost like being reborn. A couple young ladies have found out some very interesting things. So reminder of the net reminds me of my heritage. Uh, Lewis has changed so much that uh, it just doesn't seem like the same place. But that change happens everywhere, and I've accepted that. But just one token example of what our city stood for years ago, I don't understand what the problem would be, unless we've got a different type group of people here now. I won't use the other term I use. Okay. Come here, people. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't really mean that. All right, thanks, One minute. <laughs> so, sir, would you, would you support version A or B? Of, of the, we have two versions, one that would grandfather with placement where it is and one that would not. Would you support version A or B? I guess A. Okay, a. thank you. Okay, anyone else care to speak? Yes, Kevin. Thank you. Kevin Mellinson at 324 West 3rd Street. We've had a house here in, in circa 1720 for the last 26 years and actually been a member of the LHS for virtually every single one of those years. Um, first of all, I have to say, because uh, I want the L LHS to hear it, uh, we didn't know this net reel was being moved just uh, a few houses away from us. Um, we weren't informed that they were working to make an ordinance like this. Um, they didn't tell us as members that they were going to spend this money to do this. Mm -hmm. So they need to do a little bit more work, and I agree with a previous speaker who said they could, should coordinate with H Park for what it is they want to do. All right, so when the net rail arrived, people walking by the house would say, what is that thing? And I said, I don't know. Well, I've read the plaque and I can't tell what it is. So to those comments that the history had not been told before when it was on the canal, well, shame on LHS for not having that be an integral part of the Maritime Heritage Trail. So LHS bears some responsibility, but this has been a comedy of errors. Them doing something they shouldn't have done, then they get told by H. Park, you can't do this, the Board of Adjustment can't do this. I'm offended by the idea of then grandfathering, and I agree that that term's not really the right one, but going back and saying, well, yeah, you're an exception, you can do it. Because in all these years, we've worked very hard to maintain our house. And as you can see from the sign in front of our house, it used to be a grocery store for the African-American community. And we're very proud of that. But we maintain that house the way we should. And we've watched H. Park, H Park tell lots of neighbors, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. And I'm glad that they do that because that's what H Park is there for. And so uh, we're very much in support warning. of not grandfathering this in. 
which at this point with only two options, um, option B would be the one that we would support. Oh, and I do want to finish with, it is an important artifact. The reason that we've been members of the LHS for 70 years is because we believe in history and telling the history, but do it appropriately. I'm sure that net reel was never used on Third Street. Never once. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Who would like to speak next? Yes, Rick. Hi, I'm Rick Palmer from 14 Ship Carpenter Square. Can you hear me? You're a little taller. You need to raise the mic. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Ted and Council. And all my black brother and white sisters back there, don't yeah. take my uh, don't take my comments as being racial because I've been accused of that and I'm not. Okay. <laughs> the ordinance says that uh, the campus should be made a museum. This is a museum, and it's under the auspices of the L of the Lewis Historic Society. So you you can move it right out here next to. King's Highway coming down, and more people will see it than down there where it is in the town, if that's the issue. As far as grandfathering, grandfathering in, how can you grandfather something in that isn't already there and been approved? So you can't grandfather it in. <coughs> that's a bogus argument in my opinion. The uh, <coughs> Historic Preservation Committee uh, very diligently looked into um, all of the issues surrounding the net wheel in the place of the city. And they did it based on national standards. Uh, it was very thoughtful and I support their decision and I think it was upheld by the Board of Adjustment. The Board of Adjustment said, yes, they have the, the uh, jurisdiction to say what they did. I think it would set a terrible precedent if this goes through. Uh, the precedent would open up doors for all sorts of legal arguments for special groups. Uh, and I guess that's basically all I have to say, uh, other than I'm against the ordinance altogether. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> okay, who would like to speak next? Yes, ma'am. Please identify yourself and your address. My name is Susan Geckler. I live at 26 Bryn Mawr in Rehoboth, so I'm not in Lewis. But I'm a, uh, born and raised from Delaware. We've come down here to Lewis um, all of my life. I remember the net, the, I don't remember the net reel, but I remember the, the factory down here. And I will say that, um, uh, is, you know, it doesn't have the smell that it used to have. Um, so be Thank thankful that, that the net reel doesn't bring with it the, uh, the smell. <laughs> but I remember, you know, I remember that how, how vital it was to the community. And so I appreciate that. Um, I, and I think it should stay, I, I'm supportive of A. But I also sort of want to come back to what I heard earlier. And maybe I don't understand the law. And so I'll, I'll say that. But if the, if the Historic Preservation Committee based their decision on the current ordinance and the Board of Adjustments um, based theirs on the current ordinance but made the observation that perhaps the ordinance needed to be changed and what's happening now is considering a change in the ordinance, then it seems like it would make sense to go ahead and change the ordinance and then the decision that the adjustment, the, the uh, preservation per people made would not be, have be based on what the current ordinance is. So that's why I'm in favor of grandfathering in, although it, the, the ordinance does not use the term grandfather, so I think that the way it's stated, it would still be considered legal, but I said I'm not an attorney. So anyway, I'm in favor of A, and I think as a long-term Delaware resident and visitor to the area and living close by still. Thank you very much. Okay, who would like to speak next? Yes, come forward, please.
Good evening. I'm Donnell White, 228 Marina Drive. Um, just very quickly, I was very pleased to see this ordinance coming forward, and um, I'm for version A. The net reel looks spectacular. It takes my breath away every time I see it. Um, it really brings home the history of this city, at least part of it, and um, I can't even begin to say what it means um, for me um, when I look at it. I almost want to cry now. Uh, it's very important that it stays right where it is. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else care to speak in the room? Yes, ma'am. Lonnie Riley, 33065 Kiwi Court East. Um, I'm in favor of version A. Um, some people have asked or have said they don't understand why the net reel is placed where it is, but that was the center of the black community in this town. Uh, my husband's ancestors owned most of that land at some point in time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Anyone else care to speak? Yes. So, Bob Wallace, 320 West 3rd Street. I'm in favor of version B. <clears throat> um, and the reasons have been pretty much stated on both sides, but uh, I am in favor of moving it uh, in the, uh, near the canal. There seems to be a lot of land there that could be investigated. Um, it's part of our maritime history. I do want to say everything, everybody agrees here that this is a very important part of Lewis history, both white and Afro-American. <clears throat> and it made Lewis what it is. I think somebody said that. So, uh, but I really think that it was a slight, well, I think that it should not have been moved where it is. Uh, not so much because it looks so bad, I have to say that, you know. At first I saw it and I said, what is it doing here? But um, really when I think about it, I think it really does belong on the canal area. And I don't know whether the folks here at town council or on the planning or whatever, I don't know how things work around here, I've only been here 15 years. <laughs> um, <clears throat> You know, uh, assuming we're starting from scratch, what I would do is really look at that area down there mm -hmm. and let's, let's see if there's something that's gonna fit everybody's uh, cup of tea, so to speak. And maybe that would be the good, uh, good way to, to get this thing over with. Because I think, uh, you know, people said the, the, the law is a very tricky thing and uh, some people said some interesting things about that. So I'm in favor of version B at this point. Thank you very much. Mr. Thank Wallace. you. Thank you. Who else would care to speak to here this evening? Yes, Randy. I feel like I should keep my back not that way because it's had a target on it since the very first meeting. I'm Randy Burton, 117 Front Street, born and raised in Lewis. My family's been here since 1720. I wrote a long letter. It's heartfelt, it's poignant, and it is my truth. It may not be everybody in this room's truth, but it is the truth that I grew up with. I don't have time to read that letter. It'll be in the paper, it's in the record. But what it starts out as saying is good governance begins and ends with transparency and truthfulness. I stand here tonight as a citizen of Lewis with grave concern for what seems to be a hijacking of history by those who believe themselves to be in a place of power and authority, motivated only to serve their political interest or the self-interest of a select few who they believe hold sway over them or keep them in office. Moreover, it seems the welcoming and comfortably acceptant nature of Lewis, which existed for generations and centuries, 
which attracted many who now find themselves at the corner of this racially charged controversy is something which we're to believe never actually existed. We are now encouraged to believe that the Lewis, which had historically attracted and welcomed the disenfranchised, displaced, unaccepted, a Lewis which had historically been seen as a place by the folks as a welcoming community to black, white, LGBTQ, Jewish, Asian, Middle Eastern, or even just flat out rednecks, just isn't real. Somehow, possibly out of convenience, the real R-E-E-L Lewis, which has been recently portrayed as a town of old white folks who are racially motivated to marginalize anyone who does not support the gentrification of all things Lewis. This revisionist history, as touted by these recent residents, has led many to believe that Lewis is, was, and has always been a community of mo racially motivated bigots. This One is minute. simply not the Lewis nor that I know, nor do I believe this is a Lewis. Most who came to stay here know either. Let's be honest, we have a real issue. The true history of the black community has been hijacked by a group of people who erred in following the rules and regulations, sought an avenue to reframe the conversation, exploited the plight of the black, black community for their own self-interest, knowingly created a divide, and who genuinely, it seems, have no interest in that plight other than to cure their own situation. The facts are you cannot erase the wrongs of the past by creating and behaving in a wrong manner to cover up what was wrong from the start. This ordinance doesn't cure either. But here's the hope that I have. If we want to heal this community, then let's be honest. Let's recognize all the realities that existed in the past and have brought us here today. And I'll be the first one to put money down to move the real back to the maritime history where it believes. Hold on. Thank you. Who else would care to speak here this evening? Yes, Mike. Mike Taylor, 53 Cape and Lopen Drive. As the past speaker mentioned, uh, the history of the net reel is awesome and integral part of the community. It was always on the waterfront. There is this beautiful thing called the light ship the Monomoy boats that the African Americans and whites used to catch the fish, always along the water. I had the opportunity to go to the a museum at St. Michael's, the Maritime Museum. It is a shame the Historic Society did not see that and take advantage with the whole community to build a section honoring the fishermen and the nautical history of this town. I vote for B. Thank you. All right. Anyone else care to speak in the room before we go to the comments that are in the uh, from Zoom? Yes, sir. I am Malcolm Geckler. Live at 26 Bryn Mawr in Rehoboth Beach. I'm speaking on behalf of my church. Entertaining Universalists of Southern Delaware. Many of our members are Lewis residents. And we wholeheartedly support the net real stain exactly where it is. We think this is an important issue to the black community. We think they deserve this. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in the room care to speak? Yes, about Libby. Elizabeth Owen, 9 Jefferson Court, Lewis. Good evening. I'm currently serving as acting executive director of the Lewis Historical Society. On behalf of the LHS Board of Trustees, I would like to say thank you 
to the mayor and the council. We appreciate the effort you have made to allow museums to carry out their missions within the city. This has been a difficult issue for the city to tackle, realizing that it involves change, which is always challenging. I would support your draft A. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else care to speak? I think we'll move then. If there's no one else in the audience who cares to speak, we'll move to the comments. Anne-Marie, can you read them? That, were in, that are in the, uh, in the Zoom. And once again, uh, if you have entered a comment without your name and your address, we will not be reading them. So we're looking to uh, make sure that we know who the commenters are and then uh, that everyone will. And all of these comments that are ident so identified will become part of the official record. Okay. Um, you hear me? You have your microphone's off. Okay. What's, okay, so I'm going to start with Scott Lackman, and there's a typo in the address, but it's Greenfield Court in Lewis. And he has said, H Park should understand it is about Lewis history and not about how much power they want. They don't understand historic preservation. How selfish can they be? Change in many cases is good for Lewis. In this case, it is needed. Also, hard feelings against LHS by some on the committee is just wrong. Please do not listen to the narrow-minded people who oppose the history of Lewis, especially those on the committee. I support grandfathering and leaving the net real where it is. And then Jim C, well, okay, Jim Callahan, um, 26016 Moscato Lane, Lewis. He said he supports version A. Mike Safina, the president's president of the Overfalls Foundation at 219 Pilot Town Road, speaking as the organization's representative and not personally, we support version A of the proposed legislation. Nancy Lehman, 310 Mall Alley, Lewis, I strongly support version A of the ordinance. I believe the LHS campus should be free to interpret Lewis history with appropriate artifacts. They were not required to seek permission for buildings previously placed. Um, okay, let's see. Kelly Tripp, 400, or I'm sorry, Carrie Tripp, 400 Park Avenue, Lewis. How can a museum be gover governed by historic restriction? Museums use objects to tell stories and educate the public. This museum and the net does that by telling some of our most proud memories of Lewis history. Let the wheel stay. House and homeowner regulation is different in its mission. It keeps history alive, but from the perspective of a home. Abby Firestein, 67 Henlopen Gardens. I support version A of the ordinance for the very same reason stated by Nancy Lehman. We need to do what is necessary to support the history of Lewis. So many of these artifacts are fragile and need to be maintained and incorporated into the appropriate cultural interpretation. Taia Altiero, 310 East Savannah Road. I support keeping the reel on the campus, version A, but revamp the sign so everyone understands what it is. All of our Lewis history is equally important and should be honored as such. The campus is beautiful as is. Um, oh, Futcher family. Oh, hold on. I skipped over that. J.R. Futcher, um, Iowa Avenue. Remember, there's plenty of real local folks who live in Lewis. R-E-E-L, she said. Deborah Evald's 10, Harborview. 
First, seeing so many people so many people engaged in the legislative process is a victory for all in Lewis. I wish we saw such a high level of interest on other important issues. Beyond our history and natural beauty, Lewis' greatest treasure may be its citizens. These citizens, including myself, proudly serve the city of Lewis and put many hours into interpreting our codes. This is truly not a question of whether the Menhaden Reel is historically important or, or whether it is in the right place at the Lewis Historical Society. It is, it is very important both historically and culturally. This is a question of procedure, fairness, and adhering to the city of Lewis laws, regulations, and codes. Changing the code to conform to a non-conforming structure that violates city codes or procedures is a very poor direction to choose and opens the door to requests for other exceptions that may not be historically important. Making exceptions to the code to accommodate a single individual or entity opens the door to other individuals or entities to break the law, build non-conforming structures, or make non-conforming changes and ask for relief later. I sit on the Lewis Planning Commission and put a lot of energy into understanding our laws to fairly apply them to applications. We cannot diminish the power and authority of H Park by changing the law to allow the LHS to get their way. The time to discuss these issues was before moving the Menhaden Reel. It breaks my heart to see the direction that this has taken as I have always stood on the side of social justice. Please bring this back to basics and view the code and uh, view it as a code and procedural issue as it is. Please do not pass version A. Um, the Futcher family, 11 Iowa Avenue, support version A to Lewis Historical Society to have autonomy. All real locals care as much as any new local. Let our young and legacy voices and ideas be heard and included. Randy Voith, 16626 Shoal Road, president of the Lewis Junction Railroad and Bridge Association. Our group would like to pr propose the maximum height of a museum exhibit to be raised to 30 feet. We also want to know whether our exhibit, which is located on Del Dot property, would be covered by the ordinance. We have other specific questions regarding how the setback and height would apply to our future display. Um, Mike Safina, Overfalls Foundation. I would like to add that museums need flexibility on where they can place artifacts on, on their own property with minimal government interference. The, pro the proposed version A does that. So that's everything we have in the chat there. We do have um, Tom Panetta said, where can I find the revised ordinance? He doesn't see it in the packet. It will be posted um, this evening. Um, and that is, that's what we have. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Anne-Marie. All right. Are there any other uh, people in the audience here who would wish to speak on this matter before Ma we... Mayor, to, to, to Mr. Panetta's comment, just so people who are listening know what was stricken from the ordinance that is available... So in the ordinance that is available, um, line 58 and 59 says, D, outdoor museum ex exhibitions installed prior to February 1st, 2022 are deemed in compliance with the requirements of Article 4. That section D was stricken in the revised ordinance. Julie, you can put it on the screen and then... It's going up now. That's the new version. That's version B, right, Emory? Yes. Okay. Okay. While we're waiting for any reaction from people who are on Zoom, is there anyone else in the audience who would care to speak this evening in reference to this ordinance? Anyone else? Julie, do we have any other comments back that we've received? It's a rather short notice, but <laughs> wow. Oh, <boy. laughs> you ever want to know what infinity looks like? <laughs> so, so Janelle has attached both 
version A and version B to the agenda for tonight, so. Okay. Well, it looks as though we have received all the public comment that anyone wishes to make here this evening, unless there's one more time any wish, anyone wishes to speak here this evening. If not, I would remind you that, as I said earlier, the public comment period will be held open until Thursday at 4 p.m. That's Thursday, this Thursday of this week, uh, March the 10th. If you wish to uh, provide a written comment, please do so, and please either drop it off at City Hall or uh, send it to Janelle uh, at, uh, at Lewis uh, so that we have the official, so we have your comments for the record so they can be considered. Having no, Julian, we, do, we haven't received anything else, is that correct? Great. Great, thank you. So with that, I think we can close the public hearing on this matter. So I thank you all for coming tonight. Appreciate everyone being respectful. And uh, this item will be for consideration by the council at our uh, March 14th meeting uh, on Monday a week. Okay. Janice, you have a comment you oh. wanted to add? I didn't even see Janice. I have a comment that I would like to make, but it's not on the net reel. Okay. Is it in reference to the next item on the agenda? It is not. Okay. Oh. Those are the only three things that we're considering tonight. I would respectfully like to speak. What? Well, so public meetings um, are subject to the Freedom of Information Act, and there's a requirement that an agenda be posted that indicate what city council will be taking up um, at its meeting. And as the mayor mentioned, there's three items that are on this evening's agenda. We've completed one of them, and it sounds as though this, your comments are not related to um, those three agenda items. So it would be inappropriate to have this take, taken up tonight. Um, I respectfully would like to present because there will be no other time for mention of the Fisher's Cove situation because it was taken away from us. And I would like to uh, make these comments, please. Uh, it is again not on the agenda. There will be opportunity. You can we can. We can find a way for you to comment later. Um, I would like to make these comments. So what I would su suggest is that they're if very there are brief. comments, especially if they're written comments, that you provide a copy and we'll get them out to council this evening so that they have them all and are able to review the comments. I would like to speak not as a member of any organization. I'd like to speak as an individual citizen of Lewis. So why don't we do this, Mayor, because it's not on the agenda. Sometimes you take citizen comment at the end of the meeting. I will, you know, I'll counsel you not to get into a discussion because there's active litigation, right, but if you want to save it to the end of the meeting and... If you don't mind waiting, we've got two more other items on the agenda. We'll, we'll allow for this comment to be made at the end. Thank you. Okay. Yes, uh, I've had a request that we have a five minute recess. Uh, we'll take a little break here. That would be good. The new restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the new ones. Thank you all for coming this evening. I'll be right there. Yeah, I'm surprised you made this long. <laughs> <laughs> Come on now. Oh, respect. Proud. <laughs> she started it. <laughs> Sorry about that. What? I can't. Yeah. I can't take something. Okay, and I'm, we'll not, I'm we'll not going to just adjust the mic. You may need to ask what we can do. Just get one on the back wall and show that maybe it's not functional. I don't know. I appreciate your bringing it to our attention. Oh, no. It's, it's, it's nothing to do with you. Yeah. Well, I see you don't have, you have your hearing aids in tune. Oh, wait a minute. I <laughs> Oh, yeah. Anyway. Always. Okay, thank you.
Oh, good luck, Mayor. Good luck. See if I can get two members of council. See if I can get two members. If we can get Mayor Becker and Councilperson Jones back. Mayor Becker and Councilman Jones. Mayor Becker, Councilman Jones, please. Remaining in the room for the, the next item on the public hearing, please go ahead and take a seat. We'd like to get started. Thank you all very much. And if you didn't take advantage of the five minute break to check out the new restrooms, uh, they're done. <laughs> <laughs>
So uh, we're ready then to move item on to item two of the public hearing, which is presentation of and public hearing regarding the site plan application for White's Box LLC for the construction of a mixed use site, SP-2-22, carriage houses at Cape Henlopen. The property is located at the, the properties are located at the corner of Savannah Road and Cape Henlopen Drive. The properties are zoned GC, General Commercial, Sussex County Tax Map, 335-4.20-189.00 and 190.00. Uh, there was a joint site review committee hearing held on this and um, Janelle, would you care to comment on that? I'd be happy to and I can provide a little bit more of overview and I know the applicant is here to, and has a presentation to give. So the Joint Site Development Ad Hoc Review Committee, just so I know there's been a couple of questions lately, it is the um, committee that reviews site plans and they make a recommendation to mayor and council and then mayor and council holds a public hearing. The committee is made up of members of both the Historic Preservation Architectural Review Commission and the Planning Commission and it is chaired by a member of council. In this case, it's been the mayor. Um, they held a public hearing on February 9th of this year to discuss the application. Um, as part of that meeting, um, the, the commission committee recommended approval of the site plan with the following conditions. Um, one is the condition of alternative materials for the handrails on the deck. To provide additional plantings around the trash enclosure and near the parking meter, the plantings shall include native and non-native non-invasive species. To provide a separate landscape plan, to provide lighting on the plan, to provide bicycle parking spaces, and the last one is to provide an improved architecture that includes the design of the rear buildings that face um, 205 Savannah to meet code, however, be visual appealing and provide privacy, complying with city code values number one and six. So again, this is um, a mixed use site. It contains both a commercial use, which is um, metered parking, which are 13 parking spaces that will be metered along Cape Henloop and Drive. And then there are 12 residential units. The residential units are actually on, uh, not on the ground floor. They are on the second and the third floor. Um, the, the, first, the ground floor is open to provide parking for the underneath and it will provide access for um, the elevators to the site. So that is the mixed use building. Um, they are proposing access off Alaska Avenue. There is a separate request to be considered by mayor and council at a later date on the responsibility of the paving of the road. Um, <coughs> The Board of Public Works has indicated they have the ability to provide utilities to the site. This will require a review and approval by the Sussex Conservation District for stormwater management. Um, the applicant has been in contact with the historic byways regarding the fact that it is on um, byway roads. So they have been in, in contact with them. The property is in the floodplain and construction will have to comply with the floodplain. There are wetlands on the site, however, they are at the back of the property and as it is a commercial site plan, there is no required buffer from the wetlands. Um, also part of this application is a parcel consolidation plan. As the mayor noted in the overview is that these, there are two parcels um, and as part of this application, the parcels will be combined into one parcel. I would note that the property is located within the excellent recharge area, the source water protection overlay zone. However, since the site is less than one acre, it does not have to comply with that um, code. And then I'm happy to answer any questions and I, the applicant and their engineer are here. Okay, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Wall. I'm a registered landscape architect with Pannoni Associates. I'm here with uh, Mark Davidson, principal land planner at Pannoni. And we're representing uh, Mr. Rick Quill with White Bucks LLC. I'm uh, here to present this uh, project. Like, as Janelle said, we presented this to the Joint Site Development Review Committee on February 9th. Uh, they recommended approval with conditions. If you could go to the first green slide. And scroll down to where the green yeah. ones. Julian has got it. Oh. Just to go down to the PowerPoint presentation. There's like a green slide that starts it. So this is uh, on the corner of East Savannah Road and Cape Henlopen Drive. It is on GC, uh, General Commercial, 
and under that uh, can, under that uh, zoning, permitted uses are allowed. We are proposing 12 residential condominium units on second floors and above, uh, with unit parking on the ground floor. Uh, and we also have as our commercial um, use the des designated metered public parking at ground level uh, that faces Cape Henlopen and Drive. We are some nearby some similar uses. Um, you go to the next slide. Actually, I'll talk with this one first. This was the zoning map, existing zoning map, GC, as you can see, uh, pretty standard. So go on to the next slide, please. This shows some nearby uses. Um, Ocean House condominiums uh, by the beach. Uh, there's also metered public parking on the beach in two areas as shown. Uh, and also down Savannah Road, there's Denniston Pl Pl uh, Place condominiums. Next slide, please. Uh, we'd like to talk about the Lewis Comprehensive Plan a little bit. The future land use map shows this as commercial. Um, the comp plan talks about community design as being context sensitive, which we think we have done. It also talks about a redevelopment strategy along uh, Savannah Road corridor. Uh, it also talks about the historic Lewis Byway, which Janelle just told you uh, we were in contact with last week. Uh, we spoke with Blaine Bonham and Bonnie Crosby. And I, I would know them well since I'm also working with them on some gateway issues too. And I'll talk about the plantings a little bit later in our presentation. We also like to, uh, to state that our intent is to meet the core values of the comprehensive plan, especially no, our numbers one, not one, one, uh, excuse me, one and six, uh, the relationship with the sea and the heritage through design aspect for architecture. And that was part of the conditional uh, use as well. Next slide, please. This is the uh, FEMA flood map zone, and we are in zone AE, elevation seven. This will hold true for the other site coming up later too. Next slide, please. This is a map designating or showing the designations of the uh, strategies for state policies and spending. We are in um, areas two and three on the corner there. Um, Next slide. This holds true for the second project as well. This slide shows our existing conditions. Uh, you can see there are some wetlands on the southern corner tip that we are not impacting, we're not um, touching. Uh, they, they have been delineated by a local wetland scientist, Evelyn Marmauer. Alaska Avenue is to the right on the slide, and that is what we are proposing for our entrance to be from into the site. The existing impervious um, surface on the site, as you can see, there's a concrete pad and some asphalt parking. This adds up to uh, just over 7,000 square feet of impervious material that will be removed. And also, uh, it was mentioned previously about lot consolidation, so you'll see there's two parcels on that existing conditions map. Um, but they will be consolidated into one as, as part of this uh, moving forward. Next slide. This is our proposed conditions for the preliminary site plan. Uh, we show 12 units with ground level parking. Those are the rectangular blocks uh, that are on the southern uh, L-shaped corner. Um, they are 18 feet by 38 feet. Um, outlines, which is um, totals up to be about a little over 2,000 square feet per unit of living space. And as our commercial use, there are 13 metered parking spaces that face Cape and Open Drive. You'd see those at the north part of the site. Um, there are designated landscape areas on the plan, and a landscape plan and lighting plan will be part of the final site plan uh, process. Um, as I mentioned before, I did talk with the uh, Lewis Historic Byways um, representatives, and we are proposing, or will be proposing, um, mostly native plantings along the corner here, along the planting strips along the roads. Um, there was also talk about um, why we chose this arrangement 
with the buildings as such in an L shape on this side of the property rather than inverting it to the other side. Um, and that was, I think, a comment that was at the, J, uh, the Joint Site Development Committee, and we just kind of approached it with the byways too because they were interested in why. And one of the reasons is because this corner is open mm. already, we didn't want to close that openness off and instead highlight some of the plantings that are mm -hmm. down Cape Hen Loop and Drive um, that are native to the area and have that reflection tie through and continue it along Savannah Road. There's also a central island that's the central white space in the center of the parking lot. Um, this could be a landscaped island or could also potentially be stormwater um, measure, like a rain garden. Um, we have not done any stormwater calculations yet, uh, but it will all have to meet, of course, Texas Conservation District's uh, guidelines and regulations. Um, but we think that would be an innovative way to um, get rid of some stormwater. Hmm. One of the comments, too, in our uh, Joint Site Development Committee meeting was that the trash cans, uh, or the enclosure for the trash cans, which is located in the, uh, one of the last parking spaces, um, it would be the 14th parking space if it was a parking space, right, right near the entrance. Um, there was talk of that either being moved elsewhere or um, screening it appropriately, which we will do automatically. Um, we are deciding whether we can move it somewhere else to be less visible from the entrance or maybe even have individual trash bins under the homes that they mm -hmm. could bring out during trash day. Mm -hmm. uh, the setbacks for this site uh, we were discussed at the uh, conceptual meeting with planning staff. Uh, 25 feet is the front yard setback from Cape Henloop and Drive, um, which is shown on the plan. It's kind of at the back edge of the parking spaces. Um, there's an established building line on Savannah Road with the neighbor next door at 205. Um, we were keeping in, in line with that um, for that last unit to the left. And the existing setbacks for uh, side and rear in this zone are zero. And we are proposing actually a five foot setback minimum. In some places it's seven. Uh, there is one unit that is on the zero line, but it's behind the neighbor, neighboring property, so there would no, not be any um, impact on that. And the reason for that is the corner unit, um, it, we haven't worked this out architecturally yet. That's in process, of course, so it all have to meet all uh, building code and everything like that. Um, but the underground, or not underground, under the unit parking for that corner unit um, is a little bit smaller than the other units, but it has more space underneath of it. Um, so I had to move the, that, this, the, the adjacent unit back as far as I could to allow some more space to get in, in underneath the unit. And I'll talk a little bit more about the architecture uh, in a little bit. All right, so let's go to slide nine. Now, uh, yeah, there we go. So we'll talk about um, architecture now. So this was um, just a illustrative sketch of an elevation for these units. We are looking at uh, trying to be a coastal theme, uh, coastal modern. Um, we will abide by all the, of course, building code um, regulations, especially with height, as it is 40 feet in this zone. Um, there was talk of materials uh, at the Joint Site Development Committee uh, meeting, um, specifically for handrails um, and the darkness of the color. Um, so that will all be hashed out in their architectural uh, design phase. Um, most, the most important thing, though, to note is that the first floor, or the ground floor, is for parking. The grayish color you see there, and this is, this is two units side by side, just for reference. The grayish color is supposed to be in shadow, and those areas at the ground level would house the entry to door to the home, staircase going up, and the elevator. Mm -hmm. the, uh, this would have more of a coastal theme, like I said. Um, one of the comments, too, was to have a better architectural reflection of um, the sea and of uh, the uniqueness and 
heritage of Lewis tied into this. So when we have an architect on board, I'm certain that we will uh, get to those uh, styles and themes accordingly. This, uh, I'll, I'll just tell you this sketch that was done, um, we, are, we were proposing uh, a black metal standing seam roofing, as you see in, the, in that cover over the uh, middle section. That tealish blue um, is an ox a pre-oxidized copper cladding, mm -hmm. which is, has that kind of like a modern theme to it. Mm -hmm. uh, we're looking at black trim around the windows and doors, cable railings at the balconies, um, and then the elevator tower and the railings on the roof are allowed to exceed the 40 foot height. So that's what you see there on the top. Um, and in my vision, I'm not an architect, I'm a landscape architect, <laughs> but I have worked for many architects and I was trying to make the tower be reflective of one of the towers on the beach with mm -hmm. those thin windows at the top. Um, that was my kind of reflection to Lewis and the sea. Um, but I don't know if that will carry through to the architect's uh, <laughs> drawings. Um, I'm sure that he will do a better, he or she will do a better job than me. Um, that is it for this uh, parcel, or parcels, I guess. Um, the sister project is two parcels down, uh, but if you want to talk about this one first before Let's we move on. Okay. okay. So, um, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. And we are, we'll now open the floor up for comments from the public. Anyone who wishes to speak in reference to this uh, proposal that has gone through the uh, Joint Site Review Committee, uh, please raise your hand. Or if we have anybody in Zoom, Julian. I would note as we wait for Julian, I did receive a letter today, um, a little after 5 this afternoon. Um, from Melanie Mosier, um, and she had a couple of concerns about compliance with um, the subdivision land development code. Um, some of them are actually have been addressed in the staff review letter and the the plan, um, the ad hoc review committee's um, recommendations. Her concerns are the lack of outdoor lighting is not indicated. Um, we have at, that was a condition of of the commission committee um, there was a question about the savannah road as a historic byways the applicant has stated and even in my letter told them they need to contact the byway and they have done that um, and we have actually heard that they did meet with the from the byways that they've they've met um, screening of the parking area has not been addressed again one of the requirements is to provide a landscape um, plan um, concerns with storm drains and stormwater management has not been addressed. Residents in the area have complained about this in the past, and there's nowhere for stormwater to drain from this corner. It's likely that the ground level may prohibit an underground facility, and how and where will this adequately be provided? Um, the dumpster on, on Cape Henlopen Drive is not located and accessible to a standard garbage truck. It should be angled, which could affect the number of parking spaces. Um, and then it should be screened, um, which I know there has been discussed at both staff and staff level and the bless you, bless you. the ad hoc committee, um, the building site plan, the the building on the site fronting Cape Homewood Drive should be located with its maximum length facing the street. The proposed building is set at right angles to the street, which does not conform to to a provision. Um, the public view of the parking area is to be minimized on the site plan for the eastern site. The parking area is entirely open and visible to the public view. And then there was a concern with the lack of grading plan. Um, and then they did not identify how um, the wetlands would remain undisturbed. And again, as part of if this does get a recommendation of approval, um, those items will actually need to be addressed just by code regulations as part of a final site plan. And this will be made part of the record. Right. Um, again, I just received it late this afternoon. Right. Thank you. And it will officially become part of the record. And just for the record, we will keep this this item open for public comment until 4 p.m. on Thursday, the 10th of March. Oh, is there anyone in the room who wishes to speak or comment? Or we can go back to the slides that Eric showed. Uh, if you want to refer back to a slide to make a comment, you're welcome to do so. If you just raise your hand and come forward. No comments. 
Yes, sir. Please come forward, identify yourself, name and address. My name is Mike O'Neill. I'm president of the Council of Ocean House. Mm -hmm. Type of situation, 100 East Savannah Road. Right. We have very serious concerns, again, for flooding in the area. As everybody knows, during Northeasterners, we've had at least two feet of water in the middle of the intersection at times. Type of situation. We've been very fortunate never to have a water on our parking lot. Type of situation. Okay. We're also interested in the parking <laughs> concerns. Parking is, of course, a major issue in this area and becoming more so as we have more and more neighbors join in the community type of issue. We have an open lot across the street from it. It's our overflow parking lot, and we're contemplating we'll have a lot of abuse there to a type of situation on both sites, actually, type of situation. Okay. There's a number of other issues, but I'll let that go. Thank okay. you. Is there anything else you want to speak about this evening? You want to go back to a slide? No, I'm okay. fine. I've gone okay, through. very good. Thank you very much, sir. Mayor, yes. I just do want to note that we also did receive um, written comments back in February from Gail Van Gilder um, of Cape Shores, also expressing concern about um, you know drainage and flooding in that area. Okay, thank you. Yes, Rick. Thank you all for coming tonight. Rick Quill, 407 East Marcus Street, Blue Water House, Lewis Beach, Delaware. I'm not going to give you a diatribe on the comp plan, but I will say this about the comp plan, which I have right there. And it's not me being condescending to anybody here because I believe a robust debate, which people mentioned before, the first topic is, is critical to a vibrant government in a vibrant city. Less than 1%, I'm going to repeat that, less than 1% of the citizens of Lewis participated in the crafting of the 2015 comp plan ratified in 2018. That's a fact. I've encouraged for years, for years, and it's on record, that people read the comp plan and the permitted uses. The comp plan has, it was diligently worked on, I don't agree with a lot of it, but it was ratified by consensus by planning commission, members of council, and the state of Delaware. Within those confines, it has what they call the force of law. <laughs> At the end of the last topic before me, the guy sitting next to me got up and I introduced myself. I said, yeah, we're on next, the next two topics. He says, well, what are you asking for? Nothing. Nothing. I'm not asking for variances. I'm not asking for anything. I can read you the permitted uses under the code, and I have eight pages of not cherry-picked comments concerning the comp plan. And I know there are people in this town, and I have feel angst too when we talk about flooding, we talk about rising sea level. I'm not, I don't have my head in the sand. On page 26 of the Lewis comp plan, page 26, if anybody wants to look it up, Lewis cannot prevent flooding or reverse sea level rise. That's what it says. We all on the beach side of town hope and pray, because we love this town just as much as people who are environment. We're all concerned about that. We love it too, and we're very concerned about it. But it also states further in the comp plan about then you have to do engineering. So when people talk about it, I'm keenly aware of the flooding across the street, keenly aware. It never goes past the half line when our intentions is to follow the procedures, the engineering to get us across the finish line to not add to the flooding. When I hear stuff about parking, this has been an issue for years. What we're providing for on this site 
is three parking spots per unit. And I could have put more units in this spot by code and by comp plan. But I wanted to do something upscale. We know there's parking issues. We increased 13 spots. It may not sound like much. But I could have put a commercial unit in there that have taken those 13 spots. But I listened closely to my neighbors. 13 doesn't sound overwhelming, but it's better than nothing. Okay. I'd be more than happy if anybody wants to discuss this, because if you read the comp plan, what we're doing is the intent of the comp plan. We are a community of 65 or older. We are a community of people who want to downsize. They want a smaller impact, face-to-face -face intimacy. So if you want to know if we're overbuilding or overdeveloping because people don't want one blade of grass developed, 54% of Lewis is open space and it will never change. And I would venture to say, if you looked on the B side, that is a higher percentage. Okay. Do you, I got some more, a couple more comments okay. because it's gonna maybe diffuse, you can ask me and I can give you this, I can cite you at each page. We are called a residential town. What does that mean? We prefer residential. We prefer, prefer the quiet nature of this town. Do you know what the percentage of this town is residential? 20%. It's 54% of its open space. 24%. 20% is residential. In the, on the, under the housing and the cow plan, I urge you to read what it start, starts about people aging in place, downsizing. Almost 40% of our residents, by the, this compound of his change, are one person households. One person. Our inventory, our stock, says by the year 2020, we need another 210 units. Not by me, but by the anticipated build out of this town. We have 180 as of 2022 and another 225 by the year 2030. We have a limited developable stock of, of inventory of land. These two sites are not developed sites, the redevelopment, existing development on there. If you wanna go further into who wants downsizing, it's not only older people, it's the next generation. Our housing stock of single family homes is the highest in the state, 76%. Do you know what the housing stock is for condos and townhouses? Five, a little over 5%. The marketplace determines what, what us, us uh, 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 in a capitalist society, democracy, what should be built? And I'll just leave you with this. I am not gonna go to a car dealership and they tell me all I have is a suburban. A woman contacted my engineers three days after it appeared in the paper. I'm such and such. I'm interested. I contacted her. I'm not gonna reveal her name. Cape Shores, 70 in her 70s, a lovely lady, a, prof a professor at a very reputable college, retired, and said, I've already spoken to my family. I love Lewis. I want to continue to live in Lewis, and I love the Lewis Beach side of town. I have a 4,200 square foot house on three stories. I don't want to live in that kind of size house anymore. I've already talked to my children, and I am interested, put me on the list. Of course, everything else has to be determined of elevation, price, and floor plans. I will welcome anybody, anytime, to contact me. And I will go over the comp plan word by word by word. And if you go over the comp plan, 
it tells us we need this housing stock. We don't need, if you want a single family home, you have ample inventory. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Okay, are there any, yes, sir, Charlie? Can you come to the mic the so, that, identify yourself so that our viewers can listen? Hi, I'm Charlie Atwell. I live at 312 East Savannah. So I have questions around where we are in terms of some of the information that isn't here yet and how, how we can make our opinions known if we don't have all the information yet and how you can make a decision without all the information. So that's my first question. Okay. Well, there still will be more there will still be more, assuming it went forward, it goes forward, there will still be more review by the, by the But by no the opportunity for the public to comment. There will be. No, this is a site plan. This so site plan. the this joint site, site development, site correct, this is just a site plan. So the joint site development ad hoc review committee reviewed it for compliance with zoning, uh, land use, and architecture. They have made their recommendation to mayor and council. Mayor and council will then make a determination regarding the site plan. If it is so approved, then they will work with the individual agencies and staff so to it. finalize the plan. This is it. Right. And so again, the it's okay. just a preliminary plan. So I know there was concern about like a lighting plan and other things. Those are not required at the time of a preliminary plan. Um, those are typically items that come in at a, at a later <coughs> stage and staff does, um, I think, I believe the code has been updated to make sure the lighting has to be shielded and downward screened. Right. Um, so, so things, there are things sure. that we've been so, addressing. Like uh, in the parking, for example, understanding how people will get in and out of those spaces. In and out of spaces, I think that's defined. On Hinlopen, right? No, they would, it would come off of Alaska. Yeah, so yeah. their access is the entrances off of, of um, a paper street, Alaska Avenue. Right. Well, it's um, not with, a paper street. Well, so, it's not. So, it's, so there is actually an ac access to it, so they'd be taking access houses. off okay. of Alaska There's no Avenue. access off of Cape Penelope Drive okay. or, mm -hmm. or, Savannah. or Savannah. Okay. okay. So that was not clear to, to us. We could go back. Let's go back yeah. to the slide yeah. where that shows the, 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 the uh, structures and the parking. Keep going back Number a little further, 14, Julie. I think. There it is. There it is. Yeah. So yeah. the big gray area um, near the trash can. Go back. Julie, up. go back one more. There, there you go. go. Perfect. Um, so um, you, you see the larger? area to the right hand side. Um, can you near the up? north arrow? Um, yeah. There's a big gray open space. That is the access to Alaska Avenue. It is located off of Cape Henlopen Drive, but the access is off Alaska yeah. Avenue. It's about 50 feet um, for away yeah, from yeah. Cape Henlopen Drive. Here's, okay. Here's so the drive. Yeah, it just, and that was not clear to yeah. right. Right. all right. the neighbors. This is Alaska. And what, I just need you back at the mic if you've got more questions. And it, what you may not have heard. <laughs> I can't see that. <laughs> <laughs> what you may not have heard, and a general mentioned it. Sure. That uh, Mr. Quill also has a request that we consider that will be that we consider paving Alaska Avenue. So one way or the other, it'll get paved. Well, no, that's up to council to decide yet. But if if, this if the project, project goes forward, it would need to be paved. Mm -hmm. Okay. And all of these plans in this presentation are on the city's website. This app, this site plan, um, SP2-22, has its own dedicated web page. So as applications and revised okay. plans come in, new information will be provided on that, on that page so you can keep up with um, any um, letters of approval from agencies, agency plans that get approved. If we get copies of those, those goes on the, on the, on the plan. Um, the landscaping plan, all the final site plan, um, we do try to get an electronic copy, so then it is on the website as well. So for site plan approval, you don't need all those other things in place. Correct. Yet. Correct. Okay. So from the from the neighborhood or the citizenry perspective, this is this is the opportunity to make comment or ask questions on the site plan. Yes. yes. <coughs> Only on well, the site plan. Right, well, but, it's but, be the and the architecture, hearing, but, but there's no other public right. no process. Right. Other, I mean, the building right. permit right. is so all administrative. So, right. this, so you're correct. Okay, and I'm not sure that folks really understood that. Right. So or understand that. This is the opportunity. Yeah. And, it, and we're keeping the record open until Thursday. Right. So and when does the council, the council takes it up on Thursday? No, next, next Monday. 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 Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Well, or reserve your seat. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, the back row better have some questions than based on the information you have. So the, I, I guess the other, from a process point of view, that I would just suggest to, uh, uh, to Rick and his colleagues is that when Deniston Place was, was coming about, the, sure. the owner, developer of that property reached out to the neighborhood, mm -hmm. had conversations with the neighborhood, talked about what his plan was, Okay. And, and that helped. That helped. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank Thanks. you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? Uh, having heard the answers to these questions, yes, sir. Come on up. Come on down. Uh, my name is Gary Merlongi. I live at Three K Penlope Drive, uh, directly across the street from it. So, Rick, I have a question for you. I am so flooded now on Cape Pentlopen Drive. I get four to six inches every time it rains, mm -hmm. my driveway. Mm -hmm. I'm very concerned with all of the concrete and so forth, blacktop, whatever. Where Speak all that into water the microphone, if you would, sir, so we're sure to capture it for everyone. Sure. Those Where will all that water go? Because it can't go into the retention pond behind it. Yeah, please. Yeah, no problem. Wonderful neighbor. Um, keenly aware of it. Yes. I'm keenly aware of that water. I, 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 can, I, I can point fingers of why it's there, but it doesn't going to do any good. Yeah. So in our particular uh, uh, development, this is all have to be engineered to move water off. I think that it, as, as noted, and if the neighbors don't know this, there is no stormwater management on Lewis Beach because of the, of the, uh, the, the water level yeah. underneath our ground. It could be anywhere from 18 inches to a couple feet. Our particular site is really, it's, it's high, yes. the water level. This is where the topography comes in, and this is where the engineering comes in, and these are the things with the, uh, the water, I think the conservation, so conservation. Uh, would be engineered because it's not meant to build this and have the water add to that. I can tell you this, yes. I can tell you this candidly, when it rains, even a little bit of rain, let alone a big rain, it never goes over to the side of the, the center. I can tell you that, unless it's a flood situation. Because it breaks my heart when I go down there and it's just a little light rain and you have a Dairy Queen almost down, six the, properties yeah, it's down. The Dairy Queen, it goes down. It, so, it only goes three. Three or four, down. okay. Three or but four. It's deep. I mean, oh, it's I know. Really I know. Deep. Bill Huntley's a friend of mine. I, yes. I know that I'm keenly yeah. aware of it. And this is why. We could have done more, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 more build out, right. and this is why. And so, so let me answer another question because, <laughs> under the source water protection ordinance, which we, we, we worked through for almost two years, under that ordinance was about a, a, a condition for new uh, development or redevelopment that we would use impervious or porous surfaces, mm -hmm. and. I said all along that process that I would, you know, if, if, if I am in this, uh, the development of this, which right now I am, yeah. and if I, if I do partner with anybody, that it would be my commitment to them that we would, that we wouldn't, we were supposed to be obligated to put poor services under the first uh, swap ordinance, amended ordinance. Mm -hmm. Subsequently, the, 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 the ordinance that was passed, we are not required yes. because we're under one acre. But I have talked to people, and I've talked to members, I've talked to people, because we have talked, that I would consider it, because I do believe a good neighbor does not burden the neighbor right. with other issues. Yeah, I, I think Cape Henlope and Drive itself needs work, because it's got those storm drains, and they get filled up. Well, the storm drains are nothing more than French drains. They so, don't, they don't, they're not connected to us. Right. So, Gary, so for answering another question, when I was going for the ask for about the last Avenue improvements, because I've talked to Del Dot Dan Ray, I, trust me, this is six years in the making. Yeah. And it, one time when our, our city's engineer was talking about, they made a proposition about improving the last Avenue, they brought to my, I didn't know that, that Dan Rick, and I'm sorry, Del Dot had brought to, I believe, your attention, that they were looking at that issue on, in front of Dairy Queen. I subsequently. Really I and subsequently call. I've subsequently asked, <laughs> specifically yes. in subsequent meetings, has Dell Dot weighed in? And the answer is, from my understanding, no. 
Yeah. I don't know if they've weighed in recently, no. but maybe you might know something I don't know. No, I don't know any more than what I told you that night, that they were looking into it, they were performing a study. I am going to follow up on that to see where that study it's stands. Really, I'm not, I'm yeah, not, I'm yeah. not a pitcher. And I no, think no, no, it, it, it was I, specific I, I, to because I like Rick and I, you know, yeah. I like to see development. But that road is really yeah. bad. And bad. and their study is specific to the drainage that you're talking about, yes. not because as Rick says, it doesn't normally get to his side of Cape and Lopen Drive. It's mostly on the Dairy Queen side. Yeah, it is on front. Side. We don't want to yeah. Right. Yes. And it would. I can't imagine that it wouldn't, you know, based on. And, um, you know, I just think that whole Cape Henlopen Drive re needs to be redone with proper drainage mm -hmm. because it's it's really this is only going. Yeah, it's a challenge because, as Rick mentions, the high water table it's low. That's right. yes. It's difficult to get any piping system to drain to anything where it can accept it. So it's a difficult problem. But Deldot is looking into your particular yeah. issue. As for Rick's project, it's going to have to meet the Delaware State stormwater and, su and sediment um, control regulations. So, but we um, already know where that is based on, <laughs> which is not so good um, as far as, well, you it's, know. No, it's a very strict guideline. It's a very strict guideline that it'll have to meet. So, But there's actually a, there's actually a bus play, a, a bus station mm -hmm. where they pick up. But they can't, when it rains or before, that is not, you can't walk there, gotcha. it's too deep. It's sure. four or five inches. Right. So you have to go out in the road, which is not safe, Gotcha. for people to go on the bus. Yeah, I'm aware of that, thank you for okay. that. Yeah. But anyway. Yep. Um, okay, thank you, sir. That's thank my you. major concern. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Charlie, if you could get any information from Delta, that would be helpful to us. Yeah. Share with us before Monday, okay? okay. Yeah, right. they'll still have to, um, uh, contact DelDOT, um, even though their access isn't off of a state-maintained road. Um, the property is located on two state-maintained roads, so even um, they will need to talk to DelDOT, and we will re require that information prior to final site plan approval. Great. Thank you. Comment on that. Nope. I, I've had extensive com uh, conversations with DelDOT because of all the various, uh, the, the different options that I presented to this town throughout the last five or six years. And DelDOT has always said to me, we would prefer if you go, uh, if you can improve and go on entrance off Alaska Avenue, mm -hmm. always, mm -hmm. that they will work more favorably with us. And I can tell this, the people that are out here, technically, these are two building lots. And, and by law, and Mr. Mandel, I'm not asking you to comment, but if you like, I would, have, I would deserve an entrance no matter what on both those lots, irregardless of Lask Avenue. You can't landlock on two main roads. We've always, we've always tried to work, within, to work within agencies, and we're, the more to be determined. We can't, I can't tell you definitively tonight all that can be determined, because these are the next steps after this. But we will work in compliance to make sure that this is a win-win project. I know there's going to be some people who don't think it's a win, but that's the way I look at it. Okay, thank you. Anyone else care to comment here this evening? Yes, sir. We've got two people. Hey, Ed Tassine, 35 Sussex. Um, these meters, are they going to be City of Lewis meters? They'd be private meters. They're private. Privately owned meters. So that would be year-round metering? Depending on what a they chose to question do. question for the applicant. Right. Do you want me to answer your question on the meters? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're, since you're using that as, as your commercial entity. Well, okay, so the, the meters, I think in the, uh, was it the review on February 9th, that question was brought up by the panel, mm -hmm. and I, that's not my wheelhouse. I, I refer it back to something similar with the town, negotiated with uh, m and Bank for, I think, I don't know how many spots, 10, nine, I don't know how many spots. Right. It depends on what time of the day it's being used. Do, is that, yeah, right. I don't know all the particulars. Yeah. But they asked us, you know, how, how would it be, how would, how would you do? And I said, I, you know, that, that would be hopefully similar to what the town has done. And I won't go any further than that, but I, but I will discuss, um, it's not, now is not the time to do it, but I will discuss if the town was interested, I'll put it out there at least, if the town was interested that I would work out if, if I if I'm still in the deal, and that's what they, it's what it is right now. So I don't want to give too much information out. That I would work out a deal with the town 
on on them if they wanted the whatever the the under the two, uh, under the uh, uh, the banner of the town. It's it's town parking, but that's more to be determined when we talk. If if they want to talk with me on that. Okay. All right. It, I just feel like using that as your your commercial entity under the zoning. I just, I just don't understand how it's going to work out. And also, uh, would there be a prevention of uh, uh, parking trailers, boats, uh, RVs, any of those restrictions in, in those parking spaces? The parking spaces are designed under the code for car vehicles, nothing bigger than that. Um, and it also will be under the guidelines, I think, of the HOA that's created for the, for the parcel. So they would have restrictions. They could put restrictions in for the parking that only uh, motor vehicles are allowed, nothing larger. Yeah, I think your spaces are only Thank you. nine feet wide. Nine by 18. Nine by 18. And 18, yeah. That's yeah. 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 nine, code. Nine is allowed, and that's what you plan for. Exactly. Right. Okay. All right. Yes, sir, come on up. Uh, Adam Thompson, 205 East Savannah Road, um, smack in the middle of uh, these two uh, properties. I, like I really wanted to go on record uh, because I have, uh, Janelle spent quite a bit of time with myself and my wife to go over where the project stood, understanding I just actually learned a little more, thanks to Charlie coming up here and asking some questions. Um, uh, I guess the main, I wanted to go on record just by saying that I've given both uh, Janelle a list of my concerns. They're really just wishes on my end of it. I mean, uh, it, it looks like through the uh, ad hoc committee they meet the requirements for zoning. But um, I guess in understanding what's been talked about, if it's approved, a lot of these little things like where are mechanicals, mechanicals for AC going to go uh, in that five-foot strip between our property, seven condensers would make a lot of noise uh, uh, between the properties. Things like that, um, uh, it sounds like once it move, moves forward, this stuff will just roll forward and we cannot make any objections to any of that. Um, the only other thing I uh, had, and most of my issues, again, they're want list on my end of it, height uh, and, um, and, and setbacks, are really on the Cape Henlopen side, not so much on the uh, Savannah Road side, uh, other than a dumpster placement. Um, um, but the one other thing I wanted to mention was, you know, on the plan, the packet, the, uh, the wetlands, we're, we, we keep talking about groundwater and flooding. Mm -hmm. um, in an average storm, uh, the two dips parking lot gets flooded, mm -hmm. and that's right in the middle of what they're going to, where the parking for the Savannah Roadside is done. And the Alaska Avenue will flood quite a bit. Um, uh, during a good rain. And the only other thing I wanted to comment on was I understand that neither project could move forward without the city addressing the access to these properties on, on their dime, not the developer's dime. It is the way I understand it. So the city would have to say, yes, we're going to spend the money to pave whatever you're calling it, Cedar Extended and or Alaska Avenue, just to give them access to do the project. I think that's still open for discussion. Okay, that's, will that, will that come up for, back to the we, comp? We, we have a request to pave Alaska Avenue. We haven't received a request related to Cedar Extended. No, we have not yeah. yet. But Cedar will have to be, something, well, something what we're calling, will something will have to happen. Yeah, that's okay. still a discussion right. that would have to go. Is right. that a discussion, discussion part of public forum or is it all done? That will be a public forum. Okay. So, what I guess again, no public hearing, public, not a, but you there's no public hearing no public required hearing, but for that. But you can take, council meeting, yeah, it's where part it would of be a normal council a discussion meeting. of okay, whether or not we would pick up the cost or or that we would be a shared cost or whether what kind of surface it might be that would all be subject to okay. a city council meeting. So, relative to the presentation tonight, what is the end goal tonight that the city council approves it and it moves forward? No, tonight, we're just collecting information. 
Okay. We won't make a decision until, before, until Monday. Okay. Okay. Alrighty. And your question about HVAC units, those are not allowed to encroach into the side yard setback, so they could not be along your property line. Okay. All right. Because we weren't. Got, they've got two front yards and two side yards. Okay. So they got to figure out where they go. Okay. All right. Okay. That's all I had. Thank, Thank you. you. This is one of the things that pains me the most because they're damn good people. Adam and his wife. Always been cordial, supportive when my, my business partner parked cars down there. And it, and it really gives me a lot of angst. I first thought about Alaska Avenue is, I've had extensive conversations with Del Dodd. And again, on some of these sites, we can go directly in, but Del Dot prefers an Alaska Avenue or a Cedar Avenue. And by the way, Marie, I did put a request in for that. I put it in for Alaska. You had called it Cedar Avenue. No, Cedar is the other one. I know, but I put it up. But my request was Alaska. Alaska oh. Avenue. My request okay, was because I thought it was Alaska. Okay, right, so so, it. It was, so that was yeah, already put in. So it doesn't. It could be. It yeah, could be. Really it could be overlooked. And my and and my ask was. It came from a, po a point of me, and I'm not going to go into the past. But I can tell you candidly, we have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in all different options for this town. From parking, to five lots, to four lots, to talking to clear space. And all I asked for, because Del Dot said we would prefer if you go the farther from the corner, we would prefer you do that, and especially on the, the first site across from Dairy Queen, Alaska Avenue. This was my ask, and, and I was asked, I asked, and it doesn't mean they're going to do it. It was an ask. And why I asked that, because in my conversations, in my efforts in the last six years, I've had a lot of conversations with state senators, governor's office, different agencies. And I was informed by our, our retiring Ernie Lopez that there are funds, that the, the state of Delaware discretionary funds, and I'm not sure how it works, that they allocate to each city. All I was asking for is, is a possibility that we can enter in, a, in the talks about that. That doesn't mean they've committed to me. They have not. Now, I just want to address Adam because I've talked to him and his wife, and this is a true story. So if people here don't know this, and you wouldn't know it. When we first bought that property, we were going to put a restaurant there with condos above it. We had to go through a process of conditional use, and the restaurant was a, 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 a very successful restaurant tour and his wife down here. And the paper said we backed off of there because our neighbors, our neighbors wanted a restaurant. But the restaurant tour kept in demands more and more space. And I said, I can't give any more space. And then I walked down the, the Dairy Queen one night to get ice cream with my girlfriend and her kids, and I saw the lines out in front of Two Dips and Dairy Queen. I said, a restaurant would, is, if you've never been in the restaurant business, it's the liquor license to drive most of the sales. And I just thought to myself, this, this would upset the total dynamics of this corner. So we backed away. But in your case, Adam, when your builder, who was Alan Steele, and Henry Bainham was the town building official, and I know who your framer was because we used him in the past on some of my projects, Jerry Amador, when they start framing your property up, and I start showing where all the windows and the doors or whatever on, on that, and it was right within it, I think it's if your survey is, you're only a couple inches off the property line. I went to them, and I said, I did not know you or your wife. I said, will you please tell the owners that what we're proposing to do down here would a, a, a block everything, everything on there, because it was going to be a, 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 a restaurant above the second floor with conditional uses and condos up to the 40 feet. I made it a point. Tell them to tell you and your wife. 
And we knew that. We, we so if I, so this, that. Is, this is the thing that gives me angst. Yeah. Because I, I, don't want to, I, I don't want to do anything. I'm not going to get into more details. Okay. I feel for you and your wife, if you believe that or not, but I do. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else care to speak? Julian, do we have any comments in the uh, chat? K Kayla's got the chat up. Okay. <laughs> okay, Kayla. Okay, well, you gotta give me you gotta give me your laptop. Okay. So Anne Marie, now you have the laptop. Yes. Now I have give the laptop. The so okay, so Deborah Evalds said um, ten, Deborah Evalds, 10 Harborview Road. Um, this is an incredibly clever proposal in its ability to squeeze so much development into an envelope of this size. It does comply, and cleverly so, but what will the impact be on Lewis neighbors and wetlands? I have some questions. Question one, parking makes this a permitted commercial use, but legally, is this truly a commercial development or a residential? Should the primary use be primarily parking if this is how the parcel qualifies as a commercial use? If it was residential, the setbacks from the wetlands would be vastly different and more stringent, part one. Part two, as the parcel size is under an acre, it is exempt from the requirements of the development in the excellent recharge area source overlay. However, is this application truly under an acre? Is it really two developments or one development with two names? The two related applications are filed as separate applications, I dare say intentionally, but are cumulatively over an acre, K Penlope and point three, um, point two nine, and Savannah point five two. I think the case can be made that this is a single development even if Mr. Quill has referred to them as these parcels, joining and relating them further. Perhaps considering this as a single development is more accurate. A development over an acre would have to comply with the restrictions in the excellent recharge area. As it is, this is an application that solidly paves almost an acre with, no, with little to no setback from delineated wetlands. This is very concerning, and paving Alaska Avenue makes this situation worse. Again, this is a very, is a very con cleverly constructed plan. So I think that's everything from her. Yeah. And then we have Samantha. Would you like me to answer that? I, um, I, I, don't think she, I don't think it was a question for you. I mean, I think it was a question on the code. Um, Samantha Latang, 307 East Savannah Road. My chief concern is increasing the traffic at the three-way intersection by the Dairy Queen. On a typical day, there is frequent traffic by motor vehicles, bicyclists, and pedestrians. It is already difficult to navigate out of the Dairy Queen parking lot, and I am concerned that by adding additional parking on the corner lot, there will be more cars entering and exiting the corner lot. This will almost certainly lead to increased accidents between cars, bicyclists, and pedestrians. My second concern is the increased flooding risks, as other commenters have stated. By building and paving over land that is currently porous, it seems that construction will only worsen flooding in the area. Before any construction is approved, I would like to see an environmental report of the impact of replacing the grassy area with pavement. Um, let's see, then there's, uh, it, it's, I'm having a hard time scrolling for some reason. Okay, okay, so that's it. Okay, so Samantha Letang again, um, I do not think this has been addressed. For the private metered parking spaces, how will the spaces be monitored? Will there be a full-time attendant on site? And again, that's, that's a business decision. Goodness gracious. Okay, so why, why can't I? Why can't I scroll? John, John Dillon. Sorry, I'm, 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 I, for some reason I can't scroll on this computer. Um, John Dillon at 312 Midland Avenue, one block down from Cedar from Savannah. 
one block down Cedar from Savannah. My greatest concern is that no part of either development not be allowed to proceed without the proper amount of commercial space parking. I can foresee, especially the old two dips, which probably has upwards of 15 cars there in the evening, but this will now be five spaces if I understand this. Same would be true for Cape Henlope and Savannah location and any commercial space having sufficient commercial parking space. If two dips comes back in that space, I foresee those frequenting it to spill over onto the side streets and where on the first cross street. Then Marta Namek at 128 New Road. I agree with everything Deborah Eval said. This does sound like it should be one development larger than an acre. I am com not confident that excess water will be contained in this development. Um, Melanie Mosier, 426 Seagull Drive. Several issues, stormwater management is too important at this location to not be even minimally addressed. Second, it looks like four-story buildings, though zoning only permits three in this th zone. Third, doesn't have the 25-foot yard setback apply on both Savannah and Cape Henlopen? Oh, okay, hold on. Doesn't the 25-foot front yard setback apply on both Savannah and Cape Henlopen? Do you want to answer that, yeah. Janelle? She's already been, yeah. Okay. We're, we're working on it. Okay. It, it is not conforming to this. Fourth, the sub regs require, I guess that means subdivision regs require that dumpsters be screened by the building not happening here. Um, I think it Janelle. It sounds like the rest of them might be the comments I already read from her letter. Okay. Which is not um, part of the record. Okay, somebody posted. Oh, there we go. Is that? Yeah, there it is. Okay. Mark Woner, 307 East Savannah Road. The City of Lewis 2015 comp plan states, undertaking a project to encourage business opportunities on the beach side of the city along the Savannah Road corridor as outlined in the ERM recommendations on Marine Commercial. Three times. The, the first is a recommendation on page two for policy and open space and recreation. The second is another recommendation on page 40 for redevelopment strategy plan under part four, community development plan. The last is on page 52. This is another recommendation under economic development plan under the same part four, community development plan. As, oops, goodness gracious. I don't, why am I? I'm sorry. I her, her mouse is, has a different sensitivity than mine. Okay, there. Okay, on page 39, under part four, community development plan states, the Savannah Road Beach Corridor has the potential to be much nicer and more economically interesting. This can also be found under redevelopment opportunities. It also says a study was done by the city. Using the parking lot to meet the commercial element may be a stretch. What prevents the property owner from not charging or issuing new residents a parking pass? Is there a ratio for making commercial property mixed use? What I mean is commercial 50% and residential 50%. The two properties in question are becoming primarily residential and have minimum investment on the commercial aspect. If so, if no such ratio exists, maybe it should. And I, I think, and Janelle, I don't, because that's come up a few times. Do you want to clarify? Isn't it about just the for just the ground about, level? Correct. It's the it's, code it's just level. says that um, you can have mixed use. The commercial just has to be on the f first floor, yeah. the ground floor, and then the residential has to be above that. This does comply with that section of code. As the resident, they have actually, I they had to fix some of their architecture to make sure it was perfectly clear that the. The residential is two, three above. 
Um, so it's only um, the first floor is um, parking, which is not a residential use right. um, and cannot be used for residential use or storage. Um, they do have some documentation for condominium documentation um, that you, if there was a, a condition about um, using um, um, the metered parking for residential parking, I believe you can make that a condition of approval to prohibit that. And the property does comply with the height restriction of 40 feet. Um, elevator towers and the railings are allowed to encroach above. Um, so it is only a three-story building. Um, again, the elevators at the bottom do not count towards the overall height and the stories. Okay, and then the, the last part of his comment, um, as for the style of the home, the comprehensive plan on page 37, part four, community development plan, section A, community development strategy, quality of life issue states, part of the charm of Lewis is, his, is its historic streets, neighborhoods, and buildings, which give the city a human scale. Lewis encourages similar human scale, new development, and redevelopment. This means that a design of new development in the city of Lewis should, whenever possible, match the historic character of the city. Um, just. And this was reviewed, the architecture was reviewed and comments were made by the Joint Site Development Ad Hoc Review Committee. Um, and um, half the members of that, that Ad Hoc Review Committee are members of Age Park, so they did provide comments regarding the architecture of the buildings. Right, right. And, and Melanie Mosher has her hand up as well. While, while you're unmuting her, Julian, the, the one question about should this all be considered one development, because it is separated by a separate parcel, it's not contiguous, it's not so it, it's not one development. It is two, right. it's two different places. Two parcels, yeah. Right. Well, different three types. parcels. Mm -hmm. It is. Melody, you're on, you're on the screen if you care to click on. Okay. Um, I would like to disagree with Janelle about the, the number of stories in the building. Um, when you look at the elevation, uh, it looks like a four story building to me. And even the presenter referred to the first level of residential as the second floor. That means that the first residential level is two and then there's three and then there's four. So it's a four story building. I do not. I've already stated that it's a three-story building and complies with the 40-foot height restriction. I think it complies with the both. I, I, I concur that it, it conforms to the 40-foot height. I just disagree that it's a three-story three building. It's a four-story building. It's got an elevator on the first floor and three floors above it. That makes it four stories. That can be, it, it, this that, isn't for debate. This is for right. public comment. They're yep. hearing the public comment and it's good All right, we have, it's so noted. Thank you. All right, is there anyone else who cares to comment? Are there any other comments in the chat? Okay. There are no further comments. I think we can close this hearing. We can then move on to the third item that we are throwing a public hearing on tonight, which is a presentation and public hearing regarding the site plan application for White Spock LLC for the construction of a mixed use of a construction of a mixed use site SP2-23 carriage houses on Savannah. The site plan is for a mixed use site with commercial use and residential dwellings. The property is located at 209 Savannah Road and the property is zoned GC, Sussex County Tax Map 335-4.20-192.00. Eric, the floor is yours again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this, so this is kind of like a sister site. Um, it's designed in the same fashion. The residential uh, buildings will be in similar architecture and design as the other site. Um, again, this was presented to the Joint Site Development Review Committee on February 9th, recommended uh, approval with conditions. A little bit of background here, um, it is also uh, zoned GC, 
the proposed permitted uses we're um, asking for is 10 residential condominium units um, with parking on the ground floor. Um, and then the existing building, that is the two dips, uh, we are um, proposing to adaptively reuse a portion of it uh, and keep it as a commercial spot and add two units above um, that building. Can we go to the next slide, please? Again, the Lewis zoning map uh, showing this as commercial. Next slide, please. In similar fashion, we've shown some uh, uses here nearby that are uh, in similar use as this one. Again, the Denniston Place condominiums, the Ocean House condominiums. Um, we also were showing uh, some uh, commercial establishments like the, uh, the multiple commercial uses is in a strip on Savannah Road, Hazard Electric, uh, the, of course, the Dairy Queen, and East of Maui. Next slide, please. Uh, again, with the Lewis Comprehensive Plan, um, the future land use map shows this as commercial, uh, community design and redevelopment strategy along Savannah, Savannah's corridor was taken into consideration here. The historic Lewis Byways is also uh, a part of this, as it is on the Savannah um, Byway corridor. And in talking with the Byway uh, Committee, um, this the plantings along Savannah Road will mimic that of the ones on the corner of, of Savannah and Cape Henlopen. And uh, there was discussion at that uh, conference call with the byway committee of them approaching uh, the neighbor in between to see if we could somehow, somehow connect landscape-wise a visual connection through that whole area. Again, with the core values, uh, our intent is to meet all of them, um, but especially number one and six, as in the condition. Um, and we can move on to slide. Next slide, please. Which is, again, the FEMA map, uh, which shows the zone as AE elevation seven. And if, th if that's not clear what, why that's important, um, I didn't mention this before with the other one, um, the living, the first floor living space has to be above that elevation seven, um, which we will clearly meet because we have ground level parking. Um, and then there's also, I think, the um, freeboard, which is uh, another 18 inches above that, uh, I believe is that number. So and our, our first floor of living units would be above that elevation. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the existing conditions um, plan. Um, there are no wetlands on this site. They are off-site. Again, we had it delineated by Evelyn Maumauer. The existing impervious cover of the site includes paving and building, which constitutes almost 20,000 square feet. So almost the entire site is impervious right now. And that's important because in our stormwater calculations, we're actually reducing that impervious number. So that's gonna help us out a lot with when we come to stormwater um, <coughs> engineering. Uh, landscape areas, oh, let's go move to the next slide. I got ahead of myself. <laughs> so this is the proposed um, site plan. Again, we're keeping a portion of the two dips, um, which is the larger rectangle in the middle of the site along Savannah Road. Um, what is shown here is approximately a little over 2,000 square feet. Uh, the parking for that commercial use, uh, the parking calculation used is uh, one per 200 square feet of patron use, mm -hmm. plus one for two employees. Um, so we are showing five along the, the wing of the parking area, um, right there on the, to the left of the building. And there's a sixth parking space behind the building um, that that little note um, points to. Um, so we actually have six parking spaces with the uh, estimate of 1,000 square feet for patron use, which would require five, and then one for two employees, so two employees at the largest shift. Um, that could be changed 
as we go through the process because we don't have a specific uh, vendor or use for that commercial space. So that could be reduced to 800 square feet patron space, 600 feet square feet, it, 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 it'll get uh, worked out in the end. But we definitely will have to meet the parking calculation for that, um, for that use. The other four spaces behind the building that you see on the plan is for the two units above two dips uh, because they require two spaces per unit per code for tw per dwelling unit and they aren't able to have it on the ground floor underneath so we're putting them behind. All the rest of the units you see are uh, very similar in fashion to the other units you saw on the uh, Cape Penlopen Drive exhibit. Um, we have two different sizes, uh, actually three different sizes of units on this one because the units above two dips is a little bit larger. Um, but the other units are 18 by 38, similar to the ones on Cape Henlopen Drive. Um, and then we have a slightly larger one at 20 by 38. Setbacks uh, on here, we are using the established uh, setback for the two existing two dips building um, for, the, for the front there. Uh, and then the side and rear are zero. We have uh, one foot on either side and actually 12 feet of open space in the back. Uh, this would be considered for plantings um, and, and such. Mm. We do show a trash enclosure again at the end of the drive area mm -hmm. slash parking area. Um, we had some comments at the review committee to either move that to a better location, which we are investigating. Again, we could also uh, potentially use individual trash bins under the units uh, that could come out on trash day. Uh, and let's go to the last slide. Oh, the, with the elevation, there you go. So, um, and just to show or be aware of this on the elevation you see, um, this is looking, if you're on Savannah Road looking at the building, there's two units to the left with the, under, with the ground level parking there, you'll see that shaded gray area. Mm -hmm. And then what you see to the right is half of the two dips building. I had to cut it off because of size. <laughs> so just mirror that over and, you, and that would be the full length of the, of the two dips. Um, so this again is the architectural sketch. It matches the co modern coastal theme that we're trying to uh, reflect from the other side or from the other project. Um, and one aspect that came out of this too is that we're keeping the two dips and part of the conversation was the historical facade of the two dips was something that we might want to think about keeping. So in our architectural uh, progression of this, we are going to keep a, a, a historical facade um, reflection of that two dips as it is now in some fashion um, in that area. Because we felt that was pretty important to use since we are, kind of, we are trying to adaptively reuse this building. As I recall that the building, the facade of that building is a, like a Belgian block, but it's stepped mm -hmm. uh, to, a, to a point, a pinnacle in the middle right. of the building. Right. So you're now saying that yeah. what you're showing only one of would, would somehow pick up that yes. stepped mm -hmm. uh, Belgian block facade and incorporate it. Yes, and that would all uh, fall into the hands of the architect uh, when they develop those plans. Um, and Rick is talking to a couple architects, I think, right now. So um, we know how important this is and how important the site is to the fabric of Savannah Road. So we want to, again, work with our neighbors and work with the city on making sure we get the best product uh, for this site. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Questions from the public here regarding this uh, proposal? Anyone have comments? Yes, sir. Please come up. Mike O'Neill, president of Ocean House Condominiums. One concern, and I'm not a traffic engineer, but I'm concerned about the developing a four-way intersection if you extend Cedar Avenue over, and particularly with the, the number of left-hand turns that go off onto Cedar type of situation. The proposal here is one for widening of Cedar 
if possible. And second is the development of probably the reserving of a traffic signal in the future for that intersection. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second comment is in reference to the number of parking spots in reference to the commercial lot. It's ambiguous that the, we, tell you we would have just a limited number of employees type of situation on a commercial site as to one or two for parking calculations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? I, mean, I forgot to mention that also about uh, requests for both sites for bicycle parking, which yeah, we are an anticipating on putting in. Yeah. And also, I didn't mention uh, accessing this site in particular off of Cedar Street Extended um, will also help, in my opinion, improve the vehicular and pedestrian circulation because right now it's kind of a free-for-all into that parking, into that site, mm -hmm. and there's really no designated parking spaces. So this would actually uh, direct traffic in a, in a particular direction while separating the pedestrian circulation from that. Right. Okay, thank you. Okay, Rick, did you want to make a comment? Yeah, and it's not really a rebuttal on some of the other comments, but I think, I think it's really important that this has been carefully studied for years. Two dips hasn't been, but the corner has six years. Mm -hmm. So I would also recommend to people, if they want to read the comp plan, read the ARM report that's in conjunction with the comp plan that the city hired a consulting firm from out of Baltimore or somewhere in Maryland. Traffic, when, we, when, 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 you, when you say the traffic's going to be increased or, or traffic, I live a block around, uh, two blocks from this corner. There's nowhere in this study there isn't a, t I, I believe, and maybe I'm mis I misspeak, has ever been a TIS done on this corner? I'm not aware of. A, a TIS is a traffic impact study by Del Dot. And why? You gotta ask yourself why. This corner generates about seven weekends of traffic congestion. I know because I live there. And it's usually on a Saturday and Sunday. Now, we all can take in the factor in that there's going to be much more traffic because all the development's gone around off New Road, everywhere else. But I can tell you candidly, the traffic is mostly it's, it, it gets congested on those weekends. And only if it's sunny, because we park cars down there. My, my, and it, if it's rainy, nothing. But it's the people going in and out, in and out, in and out of the, of the, parking, facility, uh, the parking for the city. So I don't know if people realize this, a, a commercial entity, which we're saying we, we somehow of cheating the, the town of general commercial entity, would draw much more traffic at these sites. And I'm not gonna refer back to the only commercial entity that I could see to make any viable sense would be a restaurant down there. And I've already given you my opinion about a restaurant, that I don't want any part of that. So I, I, I understand that there is angst. So I, I hope you just give me another two or three minutes. And I don't want to read this, but I think you, you should know what the comp plan says. Constru this is on page 26. Construction's best practices on the beach side of town raise floor levels. Parking congestion and lack of parking during the summer season is an issue. We're adding 13 spaces. We're adding the, 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 the units will have three spaces each. And the community, because some gentleman talked about the community, they, they, you want to cherry pick, you can. But you don't, if you flesh out the whole comp plan, I'm going to tell you what it says. Page 37, community development strategy. Include walkability. Lewis, en Lewis encourages on page 37, similar Human scale, new development, and redevelopment. I told you, less than 20% of Lewis is dedicated to residential development. There are, page 38, there are no significant parcels on Lewis Beach left for major development, as identified in this report comp plan. The vast majority on page 39 of available land in Lewis is owned R2. Incentives could be considered for developers to cluster development 
on other portions of, of the affected parcels. Redevelopment, there's a distinction between development and redevelopment. This is a redevelopment site. It's not we're taking cornfields or tearing down forests. Especially on two dips, we're probably gonna put less imper uh, pervious surfaces on there. Housing. The Census Bureau estimate that there are 2,473 uh, 2, housing units in Lewis in the period between 2009 and 2013, an increase of only 105 units since 2000. Okay, Rick, you've already provided all the information. I don't think we need to hear it again. I think, you know, in the interest of people's time, we've heard it. Okay. okay. Would, would, can I at least encourage the people to please read this comp plan? Please read this comp plan. Okay, thank you. Are there any other public comments? Anyone in the chat? We, we have three hands raised and we have some in the chat. So do you, why don't you do the raised hands first? So Nancy, Stacy, Christian Mullins, and Kay Quinn, so we can go in that order. Okay. Julian, can you bring Nancy up? Nancy, we've got you if you want to. Hear me? Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yep. Um, my, my, I have a uh, question slash comment. Um, the elevator at the ground level on the residential units on, on both properties, um, isn't that a residential use at the ground level? And so it's not a so solely commercial uh, use? Because the elevator isn't. We're taking comments on, I think it's for the public to, we've had this discussion, it, no matter where you, even if it was a commercial use on the first floor, there would be the stairs to the residential on the first floor to get to the second floor. I see. For the, Thank the you. use, so. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay, was that the only comment you had, Nancy? Only, only comment. Thank you. Okay, you wanna go to Christian Mullins? See the next person? Yep. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. All right. Wonderful. Hello, everyone. Um, I just wanted to address the thing with two dips. Two dips exist right now, and in the summertime, it's a summertime only business. It's slammed down there. The, there's probably 15 to 20 parking spaces that are always full in July and August at two dips. And now I think the person just presenting just admitted that you're going to give two designated parking spots for employees and two designated parking spots for patrons, that's a summertime business and there's far more than two spots for that business constantly open through the evening hours. I just want to uh, request that city council really takes a look at what that's gonna do to the, the street of Savannah Road right there. You have limited parallel parking spots. People already are pulling over. You see what happens with Dairy Queen and they're hit all the time with cars and traffic. When you only give two parking spots for a busy ice cream parlor like that, you're going to create blocking pedestrian traffic, bike lanes. There's, you know, not enough parking across the street. It's going to really back up Savannah Road on a summer night. So I just think that needs some additional consideration with maybe how the city responds to traffic flow, crosswalks, and stuff like that on Savannah. Okay. Thank you. Was that your only comment, Christian? Yep, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Okay. And then Kay Quinn, so we'll Kay need... Quinn that person to identify name and address for the record, please. Okay, can you hear us? That, that must be an error because I, I don't recall make, what did, what did I do, put my hand up by accident? Yeah. I'm not yeah. really sure how that happened. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay, well I apologize for that and I do have no comments or questions. Thank you very much, okay. You're welcome. We've got so let's go on to the comments that are in the chat. <laughs> okay, so John Dillon, 312 Midland Avenue. Um, he, would, he said he'd like to adopt his comments regarding the prior hearing to this hearing, what appears in both to be minimal commercial parking is insufficient for any, com any commercial use at either site, but even more so at the former two-dip site. I might also add that 
a full stormwater management plan be required and implemented. This area at Cape Henlopen and Savannah intersection, as well as the Savannah site, are notorious for poor drainage after rain events, going to asphalt surfaces for a vast majority of the corner lot and in place of the rock drives on either side of two dips will exacerbate this problem. Someone just needs to go sit there after a big rain and you'll see what I mean. I'm not a stormwater management person, but I cannot believe covering this much space with impervious asphalt will cause a much bigger problem, or will not cause a much bigger problem. Um, and then we had Nancy. And then the um, Melanie Mosier said that the table of dimensional requirements does not include established building line in the general commercial zone. So there should be a 25 foot setback from Savannah Road to the proposed building. Again, no viable stormwater management for this location. Um, Tom Panetta um, says, I do not see how the applicant can claim he is solving the parking issue. He is adding to the demand for parking. The parking spaces per unit may be greater than the code requires, but during high season, it is hard to see how the additional traffic would not be offset by the added parking. Secondly, I do not see how this cannot be considered a three-story building. The elevators on the entrance level make this a first floor. Third, I agree with the prior comment that parking trying to make this commercial seems like a stretch. So. I, I do want to clarify the issue isn't that the zoning requires there be commercial on the first floor. It just says that there can't be residential on the ground exactly. right. floor. So habitable space. Right. Okay. With that, all the public comment in the that that's case. all we got. Okay. Anyone else in the room care to comment? One more time. Okay. Hearing none. I think that will wrap up uh, this item of our public hearing so um, I think we had agreed that uh, Janice had some comments she wanted to share with us and Janice if you would like to do that but just to be clear council because this is not on the agenda I'd, I'd like you to hear the comments and this is this is not the appropriate time to be responding and and Janice, if you could limit your comments, it's getting late. And you know, to be respectful of time, okay? Certainly. Thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, my name is Janice Pinto, 112 Rodney Avenue. I speak tonight as an individual citizen of Lewis. I do not represent an organization or any group. I'm speaking regarding Fisher's Cove. I was proud that the city stood with the citizens of Lewis and respected the rulings of the LPC. I was proud that my city cared so much about the vulnerable nature of the Fisher's Cove land that they hired AECOM for a flood study and held water workshops to educate people. They included Sea Grant at the University of Delaware. So proud that our city stood with us against all odds. Mayor and city council assessed the dangers and threat and realized that this was an unsafe area to develop. Where did you go? Where is the, ma the magic plan that no longer puts three neighborhoods at risk for flooding? We're told that when the developer gets his loose ends taken care of, that this mysterious behind closed doors settlement is a done deal. The, a the LPC is out of it. There are no longer any public hearings. If this is a new process for how things are run in our city, it does not look like good governance to me. What happened to respecting our comp plan as the rule of law? What happened to good governance that votes in public that looks us in the eye and defends their vote to the citizens. I want to know how you arrived at a vote in private that just disrespects science, our citizens, the findings of the LPC twice, the recommendations of Sea Grant, the latest being this past Thursday night on the anniversary of the storm of 62, 
when once again Danielle Swallow of Sea Grant stated, and I quote, nature is our best defense against nature. Our natural environment already gives us the ability to mitigate flooding via natural intact floodplains, healthy wetlands that are allowed to migrate as sea level rises, unquote. Have I missed that sea level rise is no longer rising? Have I missed that the water table at the property behind Rodney is no longer rising? How is it that this decision made behind closed doors that goes against our comprehensive plan and the values of the city of Lewis no longer puts Hornkill and Rodney and Pilot Town Road at risk? Where did you go? I respect the process of executive session where planning is done behind closed doors. I do not respect a vote in private. And as the newspaper says, Lewis Mayor and City Council voted unanimously March 2nd to approve a settlement agreement and general release with the developer. If the comp plan is to be changed and the rules in the process of how our governance functions is to be changed in a democracy, 